So what I've learned over the years is that if you really want to be an effective communicator, what you really got to learn to do is have enough flexibility that you can change modes quickly. So that if a person is in any mode, doesn't matter what mode they're in, you can enter their world rapidly. So in other words, if their vision will go, yeah, I see that, I can picture that, sure. They're out there, you go, I hear what you're saying. Hey, that clicks for me. And if they're kinesthetic, you can go, ah, hi. No. <laughs> in fact, if you're really gonna be effective, you must become what I call the totally integrated man or the totally integrated woman. Here's the practical value. Let's think about something here. Success in life comes from recognizing patterns. Patterns. Pattern recognition is what gives anyone an advantage in life. At the most basic level, most of you, if you had to leave this room immediately, know how to get out of here because you recognize patterns. Not because you've been through those doors so many times, but you recognize there are only so many doors and you've learned, some you push, some you pull, some you twist. So you know how to get that result because there's only so many patterns. Someone who is a great musician knows the patterns of music that will move you most. Michael Jackson knew how to move his body at one time in his life that would make people feel a certain way. We won't go any further than that, <laughs> okay? So anyone, you know, Michael Jordan understands the patterns and he's on the court, he knows what's coming at him and he can anticipate it. He has superior pattern recognition. Well, when you understand a pattern, it gives you power. Like when you notice someone's in visual, you know how to connect with them. Whereas before, you didn't even notice the pattern. You didn't know what was going on. How about Michael Jackson? Seriously, when did he become a superstar? He'd been a star his whole life. What album? Thriller sold more albums than any album in the history of planet Earth. Okay? So it was fairly popular. Now, what made that happen? Well, let me ask you a question. Did Michael Jackson look anything, anything like what he looked like in just his previous album, Call off the wall, yes or no? It looked like totally different people, didn't it? Now what's interesting is, when this album came out, called Thriller, something else started the same month. Anybody know what particular thing started? MTV. So all of a sudden, for the first time, we didn't just hear music, but we had There was this person you could move and look, and all of a sudden we had all these other feelings and sensations to feed the music that no one had ever seen before. This man could move like no one created this energy and this power and this feeling that got attached to the music. Think that played a little role in increasing it? You bet. Plus, Michael did not look like he looked. All of a sudden, Michael even sculpted his body to meet the largest number of people's criteria in the culture, which is, for example, high cheekbones are highly valued in the culture. We've promoted those as a culture. So he made high cheekbones, whereas before he had big round cheeks. He changed his hair so it was almost androgynous. He sculpted his lips, his eyes, everything to try and appeal to the largest number of people he could. How many think he would have sold just as many albums if he looked the way he did in the previous album? Let me see your hands. One, two, three, four, five people out of 2,000. No way. No way. Now, it's not just music, though. Let's look at movies. How about, um, I'll give you a movie that was a, a movie that, won the Academy Award. So you would think it'd be popular. A Passage to India. How many of you saw that movie, A Passage to India? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Look around the room. Not even 10% of the room saw it. Keep your hand up for a second. Drop your hand if you didn't thoroughly enjoy the movie. If you didn't thoroughly enjoy it, drop your hand. So if you look around the room, not even 10% saw it. Less than half of them really enjoyed it. Okay, and it won the Academy Award. Drop your hands. Now, would you say that movie was a visually paced movie? an auditorily paced movie, or a comatose, I mean, kinesthetically paced movie? Which one? Comatose. It was about four and a half hours. Now, if you liked it, I understand. I'm sure it was really pretty and beautiful, but uh, I don't need four and a half hours to see pretty and beautiful, right, personally. So what happened was I remember sitting there and they had an intermission after two hours. And there was this big trial that supposedly this is building up to, and I thought, the movie was so terrible up to that point, I thought, something amazing is gonna happen in this trial. Nothing happened in the trial. At one point, nothing had happened. There was these monkeys in the background. I thought, those monkeys are going to do something nobody else has. And the movie ends with a guy getting in the carriage, and you hear the voice go over, and the voiceover says, and I never saw him again. That's it. In the theater I was in, I heard four guys in the front row who had been roped into going there, cursing as they are going outside, right? It did not appeal to a mass number of people. It had critical acclaim, but it was not popular, and very few people saw it, and very few people really enjoyed it. I'm not saying you shouldn't have, but very few people did. 
It's a fact. So let's take another old movie. How about uh, the original Back to the Future picture? How many saw Back to the Future? Let me see your show of hands. Now keep, keep your hands up and look around the room. It's like 98% of the room saw this picture. Keep your hand up. Drop your hand if you didn't thoroughly enjoy it. If you didn't thoroughly enjoy it, drop your hand. Almost all of you saw it. Almost all of you said you thoroughly enjoyed it. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, let's see if there's a pattern here. Was that a visually paced movie, an auditorily paced movie, or a kinesthetically paced movie? Which one? Which one? How many think it was all three? Yeah, it was like, ba-boom, and all of a sudden the time machine exploded and that crazy professor walks around in a total visual mode, right? And then there's all the auditory jokes. Okay, if you're from the future, who's the president? Ronald Reagan. The actor, right? And then there's those kinesthetic moments, like when his mom is trying to hit on him. Ooh. Remember that? Ooh. Right? So all three are in it. So all three are in it, and it had tremendous congruency in all three modes. Really visual, really auditory, really kinesthetic in points. We are going to work on a little subject here called rapport. Rapport. You might want to jot in your notes. Rapport is power. Rapport is power. With rapport, you can get things done you can't get done any other way. Remember this morning we talked about anything you want to achieve or do or create or have or learn or master. There's somebody else out there who could help you do it faster. They know people, they know situations, they have resources. But they're not going to want to help you unless you first meet their needs. And you're not going to be able to meet their needs if you don't know what they are, and you're not going to know what they are unless you first get a relationship of rapport. Rapport means a relationship of responsiveness. When people are really responsive to each other, they have rapport. If you're going to have an intimate relationship, you have to first have rapport, at least in most people's cases, right? So rapport is a fundamental skill set of any human being that's going to really be happy, is going to be fulfilled. So we look at it from that perspective. The question is, how do you get rapport with just about anybody in the shortest period of time in the most fulfilling way? Well, the obvious way to start with is really caring. I mean, there's no faking sincerity and really getting associated with that. But there are some skill sets also that will cause people to feel connected to you in a matter of minutes and also cause you to feel connected to other people who maybe normally you wouldn't have felt that way with. Now, if I said to each of you right now, I want you to go outside, go to a local restaurant or bar, meet somebody and develop rapport, how many feel like you could do that pretty quickly? Say, I. I. Of course you could. How would you do it? You meet somebody and you'd probably start a conversation where you'd ask them a few what? Questions. Questions, Questions like what? What's your name? Where are you from? What do you do? <laughs> do you come here often? <laughs> Sarah, that's not a good question. <laughs> and what's your sign is right next to that one at the same level of quality, okay? So now, can you ask a series of questions and still have the conversation kind of just die? Is that possible, yes or no? Oh, yes. So one of the things that we've got to look at then is when you're communicating, questions don't create rapport. Questions are a tool you use to dig for that thing you believe will create rapport, and that is you're trying to find something in what? That's right, something in common. So you might want to make a note, rapport is created by a feeling of commonality. Rapport is created by a feeling of commonality. When people feel like they have something in common, that's when rapport really is ignited. So conversation is going back and forth, and it's really not going anywhere. And then all of a sudden, you say, well, I got to go. I got to, you know, catch my helicopter and do this. Helicopter? You fly helicopters? I fly helicopters. Oh, my God. If you fly one of these, if you done this, blah, 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 blah. energy. Or, yeah, I got to go. I got to go see Mary Sue. Mary Sue? You know Mary Sue? Hey, I know Mary Sue. Hey, how do you know Mary Sue? Right? Rapport. <laughs> right? So what happens is there's a spark when people find something in common. In fact, the challenge is that most people try to get rapport by finding something in common through words. And the problem with words is they don't always work. So what happens is words don't necessarily do it. I mean, what if you walk into a restaurant or bar and you meet somebody and you go, hi, what's your name? Where are you from? Why are you here? What are you here to do? And the person says, my name's Habib. I'm a terrorist. I'm here to kill people. We're going to say, amazing. Me too. Right? Now, see, words don't always work. But there is something that always, always, always works. 
And that little thing is something called matching and mirroring. Matching and mirroring. So the bottom line is, here's what occurs. Matching and mirroring is this concept that comes from a man named Dr. Milton Erickson. How many have heard of Dr. Erickson? I'm curious. Erickson's a genius. He was a medical doctor and a hypnotherapist, probably one of the greatest therapists in the world. People would go see other people to create change, get no change for five, six, seven years. They'd see him for one session, and it was handled. And the reason he was so good is when you came in to see him, he'd be sitting here, and if you came to see him, he got rapport with this part of your brain we call your subconscious or other than conscious mind. Now, what is the subconscious or other than conscious mind? It's the part of your brain that makes your heart beat 100,000 times a day without thinking about it. It's the part that basically guides everything. If you've ever tried to make a change and it didn't last, it's because you tried to make the change consciously, but you didn't deal with your unconscious needs. So you got to get those things aligned. What Erickson was brilliant at was how to get rapport in seconds with your unconscious. So you felt connected to him. And so you came in to see him and you said, Dr. Erickson, I've tried everything. I mean, this is a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. I need to go. He look at you and go, come on. You haven't tried everything. It's not a waste of your time. And you're already here. So let's just do it. And people go, I like him. Something about this guy I like. I know what it is. You know, he's not over the top. He seems sincere. He's not a hypester. Something about him I really like. Because he was just like who? They are. I mean, think about this. People like people who are like whom? Like themselves or like how they want to be. That's who people like. If you came in to see him and you said, Dr. Erickson, I've tried everything. I've done this and that and this and that. I'm telling you it's a waste of our time. It's a waste of my time. He'd say, sit down and I want to tell you something. You may have done this and this and this and that, but you've never done this. It's not a waste of your time. You sit down, we're going to handle this. The guy goes, hey, I like this guy. He's got some spunk, man. He's got some passion. I think you'll get something done. Because we like people who are like us or like how we want to be. I mean, think about it. Some of you say opposites attract. Bull. Opposites, you may be opposites in some areas, but you have to have similarities to be attracted. Things that you want. You might say, well, I know this couple. He's filthy and she's clean, and that's what makes the relationship work. Well, maybe what makes it work is they share the same belief about a man and woman's role in a relationship. That's the same. That's mirrored. Maybe they have the same religious beliefs. Maybe they have some similar background. And what's different are the things you're noticing. See, when we say we're having differences with someone, doesn't mean we're in or out of rapport when you say you're having differences. Which one? Out of rapport, right? Try this. Think of someone you really, really like a lot. Someone you really, really like a lot. A lot. Raise your hand if this person is either like you or there are parts of them that you'd like to be like. Let me see your hand. Say I. Okay, now try this. Think of someone you don't like. Now, I know you're a spiritual being and you love all humans and you've never had a negative thought towards any other human, but if you had a moment in which you forgot all that and you had somebody you couldn't stand, think of that person. Raise your hand if this person is either not like you or not like how you want to be. Raise your hand and say, I, if that's true. Case closed. So that's what people want. So instead of trying to get this sense of being like someone by words, which rarely work, what Erickson did was he mirrored aspects of the voice and of the body. So what are some, let's just you say you're on the phone with somebody or in person, but all you're going to do is mirror parts of the voice so they feel connection. Because by the way, do we judge people in a matter of seconds, yes or no? Yes. Not you, of course, but everyone else does, okay? So now, for example, tell me what could you mirror in a person's voice so they would unconsciously feel connected to you without knowing what? Come on. Okay, tonality. Have you ever dealt with somebody where it didn't matter what they said, you couldn't listen to them because their dentist drill tonality drove you up a wall? How many of you ever had this experience? Say, I. So when you mirror someone's tone of voice, there's an immediate connection that you feel. Somebody else, what else could you mirror? Speed. What kind of person talks at this particular pace like I'm talking right now? What part of the country tends to talk at this particular pace when they say things? Come on. What part of the country? Where, where, where? Come on. Where? That's right, New York City. Also, Federal Express commercial guys tend to talk at this particular pace, right? How do people who talk more like this feel about those fast-talking city slickers? Do they trust them? No. 
They don't even know how to say the word dog. And by the way, how do fast talking people feel when they meet slow talking person? Mary, what do you think? Mary, Mary, what do you think? Mary, what do you think? Mary! Mary goes, why y'all? Well, what? How many have ever seen this mismatch before between two people? Okay. What else can you mirror besides tempo and tone? Okay, volume. Some people like to talk loud. Loud talking people love loud talking people because they know you're a real man, you're a real one too. But how do quiet talking people feel about those loud talking people? They're obnoxious, that's how. And of course, intelligent people talk like you and I do, don't they? Do we judge people in a matter of seconds by their tone, by their tempo, by their volume? Do we make generalizations about who they are, yes or no? You bet we do. What else could you mirror? Vocabulary. Accent, if you're good at mirroring, great. But if you don't, it's an insult and you lose rapport. But if you can accurately do it, it's okay. But what somebody has said is words. People have certain key words they use a lot. If you mirror back those words, you're gonna get total rapport because they're gonna feel really heard by you. If you're in real estate and you say, someone comes to you and says, I'm looking for a magnificent home. You don't wanna say, oh, I got a fantastic place to show you. Because maybe for you, magnificent and fantastic are the same thing. Like you think dog and think German shepherd, but they're thinking mastiff. So you better to use their word, dog, or magnificent. And what will happen is they will feel really heard and they'll be connected to you. If you use their same language, they'll know you're intelligent too, All right? What about the body? What could you mirror in the physical body if you're in that person's presence that would create rapport? Okay, posture. If the person's more relaxed, be more relaxed. They're more upright, you can be more upright, and there will be rapport. Now, I want to point something out, though. So you can mirror someone's posture, let's say leg position. You'll get more rapport by this position in terms of the person feeling relaxed and connected to you than by all the words you could ever say to them. How many follow that? Say I. What else could you mirror in the body besides posture? What else? Come on. Facial expression, and most of you do this, don't you? If someone's all animated telling a story, do you sit back like this and look at them while they tell the story? No, you look back and make the same stupid look back. Right? What else? Okay, gestures. Watch me for a second. If you're communicating with somebody, and as they communicate, like when they're really making an important point, let's say they make a funny little gesture, like they go, well, I think we ought to do it this way, and they make this funny little gesture when they're making the most important point. But when you go to say something, say, you know what? I totally hear you in that. That's a good point. I'm curious though, what if we did it this way? What do you think? And you make the same gesture and you watch them, it's like, <gasps> a friend. And they get excited. You think I'm kidding. If someone's telling a story and they go, well, we did this and this and this, and you go, really, this and this? They go, oh yeah, and they get better at telling their story. They don't know why, but they feel connected to you. So you got gestures and posture, facial expressions, leg positions, what else could you mirror? Eye contact. Now here's an interesting thing. Most people who are in business have been taught that if you are going to let someone know that you're being honest and sincere, that what you should do is make direct eye contact and not break eye contact for at least 45 straight minutes without breaking eye contact. Now, there's a slight problem with this. People like people like whom? Themselves. What kind of person stares in your eyes for 45 minutes without blinking and doesn't move their eyes at all? Aliens, that's who. Most humans tend to look away. So what you gotta do is look, when they look away, look away. Give them the space to look away. Now if you meet somebody who walks eye contact with you and doesn't break eye contact for 45 straight minutes, you stare right back. They'll know you're an alien too, it'll build rapport. Okay, what else could you mirror? Come on. Someone said touch, absolutely. See, you can get more rapport with some people by touch than by anything you could ever say to them. But you don't want to guess. You don't go, hey, he looks like a child toucher. Hey, Jason, love your hair, buddy. You do that, you could get killed. You touch in totally non-sexual ways. You just got to notice. If Louis comes by and goes, hey, Tony, thanks a lot. And he hits me in the shoulder like this. If I come back to you and I say, him and I say, hey, thank you, Louis, and I hit him like this, I'll get more rapport by that touch than anything I can say. Because I'm touching the same way. If you go to shake somebody's hands and you notice some people, when they shake your hands, they squeeze and see if they can, you know, pop a few blood vessels. Other people have a fish handshake, like, hi, right? right? However they shake your hand, you shake it back the same way, you'll have rapport. If they squeeze hard, you squeeze hard. You're both real men, right? It's more of a fish, you're both fish, right? And what happens is there's a connection that comes from the same kind of touch that you can't get through words, just can't get through words. What else could you mirror? 
Proximity, that's how close you get to a person. Everybody has a different amount of location or different amount of closeness that they can comfortably deal with. Now the challenge is for a lot of people, what a lot of people do is when they're communicating, everyone has different levels of proximity that they think they need, right? So some people, they don't feel really comfortable unless they get about this close, they go, hi, are you enjoying the seminar? <laughs> right? Right? And they usually have bad breath. <laughs> and when that happens, what do you want to do besides punch them? The minimum you want to do is pull back. But if you pull back, you just broke rapport. So what do you do? You got to hang in there. But everyone's different. So as you're walking by, you have to use your sensory what? Cutie, you see how close can you get? So if I start walking up towards this gentleman here, he's fine. Here, I'm already on the edge. Now, how do I know that? Because he's chewing his gum and also he paused with the gum, right? <laughs> he wasn't pausing when I was here. I come here. Now, if I come here, now his eyes freeze. Every, his whole face is now frozen. This means you're too close. Now, maybe standing, it would be different for him, but you got to pay attention. Because what happens is you lose rapport by being too far away also. There's no sense of connection, but you also lose it when you get too close. So how do you know how close to get? You use your brain. You notice, walk here, she's comfortable here. I'm on the edge right here. No, don't want to go there. Right about here, it's perfect. Okay? So you just get that feel, and you'll, you'll notice it. What are you saying, Tony? Are you saying they cross their legs, I cross my legs? They lean back, I lean back. They lean forward, I lean forward. They uncross, I uncross. They pick their nose, I pick my nose. Exactly. <laughs> now, you don't have to mirror everything a person does to be in rapport. You can just do leg position and a gesture, and you'll be in total rapport. Or you can just do voice, right? Vocal qualities, like their tonality is an example. In tempo and get rapport. Or you can do, you know, eye contact and a gesture, same as them, and you'll get rapport. So you don't have to do all these things at one time. Now, if you think people are gonna notice when you're mirroring them, number one, they won't. Number two, and the reason they don't, by the way, is because it's something you already do. But here's the problem. Most of you wait till you get enough words in common, and then finally you put your voice and body in common. But words don't always work. If you go and put your body in common, if you mirror that, no one you meet will you not have rapport with. I mean, no one, as long as you really mirror them. No one. Up until now, we've been talking about how to get rapport by basically mirroring someone's physiology. But we're leaving out the auditory in terms of any real focus. So what we want to do now is we want to make sure we add the auditory and also give you a shortcut. So when someone's coming towards you, you don't have to stare at them all of a sudden and go, oh, see, what are they doing right now? You know, they're doing this with their hand and that with their face because it's too complex. So I want to give you a really good shortcut that will immediately give you an experience of this. The shortcut's really simple. It has to do with understanding the human nervous system. Now, we all know that in order to take information in to our bodies, into our minds, we have five senses to take them in. What are those five senses? Quick. Sight, V for visual. A for... K stands for what? Anybody know? Kinesthetic, which means feeling, sensation, etc., right? those feelings. O, which stands for olfactory, and G, which stands for gustatory. And gustatory is what? Taste. Okay? Now, while we can take everything you experience that makes you happy or sad, anything you learn, anything you have an experience of in life, comes through those five senses. The only way you know anything, at least that we can measure. But when you communicate, you also communicate with those same five senses, whether you know it or not. Now the truth though is, of the five senses, most of us as human beings don't communicate, let's say, taste and smell as primary ways of communicating, although we do some. Our primary way of communicating day to day for most of us is either through the visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. And so here's a neat shortcut. When, if I said to you that I'm right-handed, as a right-handed person, does that mean I don't use my left hand? No, it simply means I'm gonna go here first because that's my strength within my nervous system. It's stronger. Well, similarly, people develop a strength or a preferred sense from which to take information in. And some people are more visually driven, as an example. Some are more auditorily driven and some are more kinesthetically driven. Now, we all are all three, just like you use your left hand, but there becomes one that becomes our preference. When a person is expressing a preference, 
you can identify what mode they're in. And instead of having to look at every little thing that person's doing, moment to moment, here's what's doing the leg, here's what's doing the face, here's what's doing it. You can begin to say, oh, they're in a visual mode. And when someone's in a visual mode, they use their body differently than when somebody is auditory or somebody is kinesthetic. So for example, when a person's in a visual mode, they tend to talk a little bit louder, a little bit faster. They tend to gesture much more quickly than normally. What they do is they say things like, hey, picture this. Take a look at this. Hey, can you see this? Take a look at this right now. And they talk more rapidly. You don't care how it sounds because worth, picture's worth a thousand what? Come on, a thousand what? Worse, they don't care how it sounds. They're just trying to get out of their system. They're communicating like this with intensity. That's somebody who's in a really visual state. When somebody is in more of an auditory state, then they have a different rhythm, a different tone a different resonance to their voice. Even their gestures have more rhythm to them. As opposed to somebody who's talking visual like this, somebody who's more auditory will begin to have that rhythm in their voice and they use words like, listen to me, hear what I'm saying, or that clicks for me. And these people do not necessarily feel great about somebody who's talking to them in a hyper-visual state because for them, it's not just what you say, it's also what? How you say it. As opposed to visual people, they don't care. Come on, take a look. I try person says, let's talk about it. Different experience. Then there's another kind of person who's more, um, I don't know, more, more kinesthetic. And uh, this person's more, I don't know, more touchy and feely. And they talk more slowly. And um, they, um, they say, you know, I need a more concrete example or um, it doesn't quite feel right to me, or, you know, I don't know, I just, I need a better sense of it. And these kind of people basically um, drive me up the wall. <laughs> now, I'm all three people, aren't you? Yes or no? Yes or no? But don't you have a preference, a place you tend to go to first? I mean, when you really are communicating, you tend to go there first, sure. So if I start talking to you this particular mode right now, come on, what mode am I in right now as I start to talk to you? What mode? Come on. What mode? And um, what if um, I, uh, and what if I began to speak to you like this and I said, listen to me, auditory. So now knowing that, what's nice about that is it's a different quality of movement, different quality of voice, different quality of everything that goes with those. So you don't have to watch everything the person's doing. You go, oh, the person's in visual. I'm going to respond more visually. And you don't have to be identical in every way. Just the tempo and the movement and so forth will absolutely get you in rapport with that person. Now, knowing this can help you understand why sometimes relationships don't work in business or personally. Sometimes you like the person, but your styles are so radically different that what it does is it kind of separates you. Because I want to tell you something. This sounds terrible, but it is true. Style is more important than substance initially, not long term. Initially, how many times have you seen somebody who's brilliant, got great substance, but no one listens to them? It's because they don't mesh their style in a way that connects with other people. Now, substance is what matters long term. But without style, even substance doesn't have the same value. So you want to enter somebody's world. And again, if you say, well, isn't that being phony? You're acting like this person or you're using a voice like this person? No, it's called being respectful. You know, if you go overseas to another country, you're not appreciated as an American if you don't at least try to speak the language of the people you're talking to, true? And it's, it's a lot easier to just do whatever you do than to see where someone is and care enough to enter their world. Similarly, even though we all speak the same language in this room, we all have a different nonverbal language. And so if you enter someone's nonverbal world, you're gonna have a lot more rapport. Oh, so it's not just music, it's movies too. Oh, it must just be entertainment. Well, how about politics? Every country I've gone to, and I go to 65 countries in my work, I can predict who will win and have in every election, because I started in the United States and learned a little technique over about 15 years, because I used to do the seminar literally every weekend, three weekends a month minimum. So I would poll people during those times, during all the elections. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, politics never determines who wins. What determines who wins is who appeals to the culture the most visually, auditorily, kinesthetically, and has the most congruency. And of those, the ones that's most important is that they can move you emotionally and you think they're congruent. We'll even think, take somebody who's ugly in our minds, make them okay, because after all, the president. We change our mindset. So let's do a little test, okay, as an example. Do you remember when George Bush was running against Bill Clinton? In what was it, 92, right, 92? How many remember that election? Okay, good. So you had George Bush, and you had Bill Clinton, and you had, uh... <laughs> 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 
Ross Perot. Now, let me tell you something, right? Now, let's do a little test, okay? How many of you in 1992 thought George Bush was really an attractive man visually? Attractive man visually. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. About 15 people in 2000. How many thought Bill Clinton, regardless of his politics, was an attractive man visually? Let me see a show of hands. So did the interns. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so about 80%, 80, 85% of people thought he was attractive visually. How many of you thought Ross Perot was an attractive man visually? Okay, a couple blind people, good, okay. Now, so who wins the visual? Quick, who wins the visual? Quick. Bill Clinton, okay, great. Now let's go to auditory. How many thought George Bush had an attractive tone of voice in 1992? Okay, about six or seven people out of 2,000. How many thought his voice was annoying and he sounded like he was whining most of the time? Let me see your hands. Keep your hands up. Now I know George Bush and I respect him immensely, but his voice sounded horrible. Look at the room. 80% of people thought he had a bad sounding voice, whiny sounding voice, not just bad. How many thought Bill Clinton, regardless of his politics, had an attractive tone of voice? Let me see your hands. Look at this. 90% liked Clinton's voice. How many thought Ross Perot had an attractive tone of voice? Okay, two deaf people, that's good, okay, great. So who wins the auditory battle? Quick, who? Bill Clinton. Okay, how many felt like in 1992, George Bush could move you emotionally in 92 election? Let me see your hands. Three or four, but George Bush couldn't move George Bush in 1992. So about the last two weeks, he decided to run, if you guys recall. The rest of the time, he had no emotion. Right? That was one of his strengths before. None at all. How many felt like uh, this guy, Bill Clinton, could move you emotionally? Now notice, keep your hands up, not as much as he looked or sounded, but still really high, 75% of the room, versus 80 and 90 on the other ones. How many felt like Ross Perot could move you emotionally? When he said something, it was going to happen. Let me see your hands. Okay? So Ross, and by the way, I can tell you at the time, Ross and Clinton, Ross was slightly ahead of moving people emotionally. Most of you probably don't remember 92, but I can tell you, I, every, country, every city I went to, we asked. And the reason was he was so intense and strong, and Clinton was more quiet. You've got a lot more time under, with, under your belt with Clinton now. And then lastly, most important one, so who wins the auditory, by the way? Who won the auditory in that area was clearly, excuse me, kinesthetic, was clearly Ross Perot at that time. Right now, he's about split with his audience. But here's where elections are won and lost, congruency. How many felt like George Bush in 1992 was really congruent? What he said he meant. Remember at that time the Iran-Contra thing was coming out. How many felt he was congruent? Not even 1% of the room. How many felt like uh, that uh, Bill Clinton with the Jennifer Flowers affair, I didn't fully inhale, et cetera, was totally congruent? Let me see your hands. Bill Clinton was getting destroyed at this level. How many felt back then, before he left the election, that when Ross Perot said something, he flat meant it, he was gonna get the job done. Let me see your hands. Now keep your hands up and look at the room. Look at this room. You got 95, 98% of the room believing this guy will get the job done, he's congruent. As a result, who was winning? Ross Perot. He's an old geezer who's gonna be the president, it's cool. He didn't sound too good, but you know, that's okay. We'll give him voice lessons. Let's get somebody here and kick some butt instead of one of these politicians. And he was winning, till he made the most unbelievable decision possible. In the lead, he quits. And his reason is, those Republicans are gonna mess up his daughter's wedding. Uh, who could imagine? And all of a sudden, people can't even believe this guy. He's gonna be president of the United States. So when he leaves, now here's your choice. A guy that doesn't look good, a guy that doesn't sound good and doesn't feel good and is not congruent, even though he's a nice man, George Bush, versus a guy that looks good, sounds good, feels okay, but it's not congruent. So the same day he announced he was leaving the race, Bill Clinton made the most important decision of his political career. He got himself a vice president who people thought was congruent. But in those days, it was Al and I. Remember that? Al and I, Al and I, everywhere. You never saw Clinton alone. It was he and Al catching a football. He and Al on the bus going to CDC. Al and I, Al and I, Al and I. This new generation, remember that? How many think Al Gore is an attractive man visually? Okay about 75% of the room. How many think he's attractive auditorily? About 30% of the room. How many feel like he can move you emotionally? <laughs> How many feel though that he's congruent, that what he says he really means? Let me see your hands. Keep your hands up, look around the room. And guess what Clinton scored here? By association, he got congruency. So now his ticket offered you all three, Bush's ticket didn't offer you any of it, 
And then the last minute, who gets back in the race? He gets back in the race and still, even though he quit, people say, well, I think he still do the job and a bunch of people vote for him. And so Bill Clinton gets elected with the smallest percentage of the vote in any presidential ever, any president ever elected. And basically because he patched together that process. So then you pop into 1996 and you got Bill Clinton run against who? Bob Dole. Who likes to talk about Bob Dole himself in the third person? Let me tell you what Bob Dole thinks. <laughs> How many think Bob Dole's an attractive man visually? Okay, six people. How many thought in 1996 that Bill Clinton was an attractive man visually? Okay, notice not as many thought he was as attractive, but still way up there, totally beyond Dole. How many thought Bob Dole had an attractive tone of voice? How many thought Bill Clinton had an attractive tone of voice? So who wins the visual and the auditory? Clinton. How many felt like Bob Dole could move you emotionally? He did one speech, one, where he moved people emotionally and he jumped in the polls right after the Republican National Convention. One, just one good talk. People wanted to believe in Bob Dole at some level, but he couldn't sustain it. And how many felt like Bill Clinton, even if you didn't like certain things, could move you emotionally? Sure. And how many felt like Bob Dole was congruent? This is his one asset. How many felt like Bill Clinton was congruent? How many felt like his co-partner there was congruent? So guess what? You have the choice somebody looked good, sounded good, felt good, wasn't congruent, but he's already been there and the economy's going well, versus a guy that doesn't look good, doesn't sound good, doesn't feel good, but he's probably honest. Guess what? It's not hard to figure out who win, right? So I've done this every election, anywhere you look. Now let's take it beyond this election. Think in history. Think of a president from modern history who you believe had the most power to influence in modern history. Somebody you thought had energy and charisma and power, somebody you'd never forget. How many of you thought of John F. Kennedy? Raise your hand if you thought of Kennedy. Keep your hands up nice and high. You got 90% of the room thinking of one man. Some of you said Reagan, some of you said other people. 90% of you, drop your hands. Why? How many thought John F. Kennedy was an attractive man visually? Hmm. 98%. How many thought he was attractive auditorily? Not 95%. How many felt he could move you emotionally? Mm. How many felt when he said something, he meant it, he was congruent? Khrushchev thought so also. So some people say, well, we remember him that way because he was killed. Now, was he popular only in this country or around the world? Why? Because if you walked into a visual culture, he was visual. If he was auditory, he was auditory. If he was kinesthetic, he was kinesthetic. I got news for you, it's not politics. It's your nervous system. How about parenting? What should be the best parent? A visual parent? Come here, Johnny, let's get this done. An auditory parent? Johnny, I think we should talk about this. Can I start come here, buddy? What should be the best parent to have? You want to be a VAC. A visual auditory kind of study. You want to be one of these. So I don't care if it's parenting or it's politics or it's music or it's business. If you're going to succeed, you must become attractive visually, auditorily, kinesthetically, and you must be congruent. If you do those four factors, there is no limit to the number and quality of people you can influence in your lifetime for good. If you don't do that, you gotta settle for something a lot less. And that's true in your career and your business as much as anything else. Any study you've ever seen, people who come across more visually, auditorily, kinesthetically attractive and congruent will move up in business even if their skill sets are not as high. There's no one that's better than the other. They're all important. You want to be all three. You want to be a vac. You don't want to be stuck in any one of them. You're obnoxious stuck in visual. You're difficult to be able to deal with people in kinesthetic. You're kind of middle of the road if you're stuck in auditory. You've got to be able to enter all three, and you can't. One skill you've got to master to have an extraordinary quality of life living in the day and age we live in today it is the skill of learning rapidly. And if you can learn rapidly, you've got the world at your fingertips. If you can't, you're left in the dust. Because it's, it's a cliche to talk about changes happening so rapidly all around us, but it's also true. We're living in a time where, you know, things used to change over the course of an age or generations. Now an age is about six months. 
companies manufacture a product that's a brand new innovative product. They used to expect to have a five-year time period before somebody could knock them off. Now it happens in three to six months. I mean, the world is changing so rapidly, and there's tremendous opportunity if you're learning rapidly. The problem is none of us have really been taught how to learn. We've learned, but we've not been taught how to learn. Maybe I should first explain what learning is, because if you're not learning something, it's not because you're not smart. It's because the teacher's strategy for teaching is not getting through to you, and you're going to want to coach them so they can get through to you quickly. So let's give you an example. Here's what learning is. If you take a human being, and here's your human being, and you want this human being to learn something. Well, what is learning? Learning is when you take something that you don't understand, you don't know. So let's call it, learning is when you take an unknown, some unknown thing, and when you've learned it is when you can link that unknown directly to something you know, a known. So the way to describe learning is learning is nothing but the creation of a relationship. Learning is when you create a relationship between the known and the unknown. When you connect those two things together, instantly you've known. Now let me give you an experience of what I mean. If, um, if I come along to you right now and I do this, I go, now, what just happened is your brain searched 10 billion files and found nothing. <laughs> Searched every file you had, you had nothing there, right? But what happens is, if I said to you, Zaba, 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 what's Zaba? Come on. Ah, a known, an unknown, some sound. As long as there's a known you have a reference for, and then I attach it to that, you know what it is. It's kind of like, did you see the movie uh, Dances with Wolves? Remember when Kevin Costner is at the little camp, and the first time the Indians come to see him, do you remember that? And he's kind of freaked out a little bit because they're all three on horseback and he's trying to figure out what to do and they don't look like they're too intense. So he's trying to communicate. And he says, uh, hi, how are you? And that's like, what's up? They have no understanding what he's talking about. So they go, what's up? And he doesn't know what that is. So then he thinks for a second. He goes, oh, oh, he goes, he goes uh, uh, like this. He goes, right? And they start looking at him like he's on drugs or something, right? And he goes, buffalo, buffalo, buffalo. And one guy starts looking at him saying, this pale face is really crazy, right? So no, no, the other guy goes, Tatunga. He goes, Buffalo, Tatunga, Buffalo, Tatunga. And what happens? In a few seconds, he knows Tatunga is, and they know Buffalo is, how they learn. They learn by taking a known and linking it to the unknown, or an unknown and linking it to the known. When that relation is created, you know. That's it. That's how learning happens. So why do people not learn at times? Because most teachers do this. They take an unknown, some words you don't know, some description you don't understand, and they try to link it to another thing you don't know. Isn't that true? And so now you have nothing inside of here, no understanding, and it's all out here confusing you. It's like, I don't know about you, but I was a great student because I loved to learn, except I hated geometry, algebra, and trigonometry. I hated it. Two reasons. Number one, I saw no purpose for it for me. <laughs> I mean, if I was an engineer or something, it'd be different. But for me, I saw no value. And by the way, people don't learn when they don't see a reason to, right? When they don't see a way to apply something, there's not a purpose for it, right? So I didn't see that. But the second thing was, if you didn't do your homework, you were screwed. Isn't that true? Because every night there were new words, new vocabulary, new relationships. So if you came into class the next morning, they went the hypotenuse of A, B, squared by the, the radius of X, Y, I'd be like, I am in deep stuff, man. Right? Because they were relating all the stuff that I had no relationship to. How many can relate to this in some way? Say, I. Okay, so that's what happens more often when people try to teach. Because they understand both those words. So they're knowns for them. So you say, well, how do you explain this? And they say, oh, it's just like this. Like, I'll give you an example. The best teachers always teach you something by relating to something you already know. I don't know what you believe religiously, and I'm not telling you what to believe, but most people, regardless of religion, would say Jesus Christ is a pretty good teacher since 4,000 years later, right? And information is still hanging out here. So how did he teach? When he went to fishermen, he said, now look, guys, I want you to go out and recruit Christians. Is that what he said? No, he wouldn't say recruit. They have no reference for what recruit means. He said, I want you to go out and become fishers of men. And then sure enough, they went, oh, I get it put a little bait out. As soon as they bite, reel them in. 
They understood the whole process, right? They didn't need any coaching. Instantaneously, you have the whole thing. But if you don't do that, you're in trouble. I'll give you an example. Who here knows a lot about electricity? Raise your hand if you know a lot about electrical components, electricity. Okay, only a couple of you. Okay, good, this will be a good example. So what if I wanted to explain to you in an electronic component what a resistor is? Well, I could explain it to you this way. If you understand the function of a resistor, all you have to understand is that wattage and ohms usually migrate together to electrical components until what happens is the oscillation rate expands geometrically and the resistor causes those to have a wattage that is balanced. Okay? Now, how many understand that? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you understood what I just said. Raise your hand. What I said made no sense whatsoever. There is no relationship between those things. But I'm glad you think you know what dog means. That's really good. I'm really glad, okay? Okay. What I said had no relationship. I just took a bunch of electrical words and slapped them together somewhat congruently. There was no relationship. And all of a sudden, it's outside of here. It's outside of you. You can't compute it, right? So that process, right, that process is what happens when you're not learning. But if I wanted to teach you what resistors were, and I did it this way, what if I said to you, have you ever seen water running through a pipe? How many have seen that? Say, I. Your brain goes, yep, I'm smart. I've seen that. So it feels confident, right? So now I say, well, imagine if you could for a moment that there was like a lever here, a flap, that you could put all the way down or part the way up or all the way up. What would that flap affect? The flow of the what? Water. This is what a resistor does to electrical current in an electrical component. How many of you instantly know what a resistor is now and what it does? Raise your hand. Say aye. aye. How long did that take? A minute. Why? Because we related an unknown to a known. So I can learn anything. Like, you know, I went and studied these guys that were nuclear physicists, and they built one of them, helped build an atomic bomb. And I want to understand how that worked. And he started going off in all these words. But see, I don't have any embarrassment of saying, excuse me, I don't know what those words mean. Do me a favor. What's this like? Explain this to me like in a metaphor. Right? And then they may give you a metaphor. Oh, he goes, oh, it's just like when atoms and electrons. No, 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 no. Try bread. <laughs> try a sandwich. <laughs> Let's try a different metaphor here. Something I can clearly relate to. And you know what? Sure enough, I get him to explain it. All of a sudden, I understand it. Now when he uses the words, I know what the words mean. So if you're never, if you're in a position where you aren't learning something, don't go, oh my God, I'm not getting it. Oh my God, they're all understanding it. Just know you don't have the same references as those people around you. So get them by having them say, what's that like? Find a similarity. Here's a simple definition of strategy. A strategy is a specific way of organizing. A strategy is nothing but a specific way of organizing your resources. A strategy is a specific way of organizing your resources. Now, we know what it means to organize, right? In a specific way, it doesn't mean random. It means a very specific way of organizing your resources. What are your resources? Well, it depends on the strategy. If it's financial strategy, then your resources might be money, time, decision-making, the way you feel, because that's going to affect the way you use your money. How many follow that? Those will all be those. If we're talking about, uh, let's say, love strategies, what makes you feel loved is there's only five possible elements for that. The resources are what you think about, what you focus on, what you picture, what you say to yourself, how you breathe, how you move. Those are all resources. And if you use them in a specific way, you'll feel loved or unloved. How many follow that? Say, I. So a strategy is a specific way of organizing your resources in order, in order to consistently produce a specific result. Why do we want to consistently produce a specific result? Because the whole idea of a strategy is once you figure something out, you can do it as, much, as often as you want, every time, totally consistent. And it's a specific result you're after. So what's an example of a strategy? Well, as I already said, are there strategies for having too much month at the end of the money? Are there specific ways of organizing the way you spend money, the way you spend your time, 
the way you think about things, your emotion, your feeling, that will cause you to constantly have less money than you need, yes or no? Yes or no? How many have mastered these in your past? (laughs) Are there specific strategies for financial abundance? Ways of earning, ways of saving, way of spending, way of investing that will consistently cause you to have financial abundance, yes or no? Of course there are. What other kinds of strategies are there? You tell me. What other kinds of strategies are there? Yes, sir. Strategies for cooking. Are there specific ways of organizing various ingredients and the heat you put them in, how much time you spend with it, that will cause you to consistently get the exact result you want in baking, for example, or cooking? Yes or no? What do we call those? What do we call those strategies? Recipes, okay? Strategies for managing your time. Are there specific ways of organizing what you focus on, where you spend your time, how much time you spend on things in order to consistently feel like your life is being managed effectively? Yes or no? Sure, are there strategies for becoming stressed? Are there strategies for depression? Is depression a strategy? Yes, it's hard to get depressed. You gotta work at it. You gotta organize the resource of your breathing and your shoulders and the muscles in your body and your face and what you picture and the tone of voice you use and what you say to yourself and what you imagine to feel depressed. It's a lot of work. Now, if you practice it a lot, you get good at it and do it at will. Okay, but it is a strategy. It's a, it doesn't happen unless you do things that way specifically. Is joy a strategy? Is there a strategy for feeling joyful or happy on a consistent basis, yes or no? What other kind of strategies are there? Athletic strategies, peak performance strategies, ways of organizing, what you think about, the way you move your body, what you notice, what you anticipate when you're in a sport in order for you to consistently perform at your peak. Somebody else. Attraction strategies. Listen, when you get attracted to someone, it is a strategy. There are specific things that trigger you to feel attracted to someone or not feel attracted to someone. It's very specific. You may not be paying attention to it consciously, but it's there. And by the way, do you have strategies already for trying to cause people to feel more attracted to you already? Yes or no? Ways of organizing, the ways in which you dress, the ways in which you speak, the way in which you look at someone, all those things, what you do, maybe where you touch them when it's appropriate so that hopefully it increases some of that attraction. Yes or no? Oh, yes. So here's the truth. Any result you've ever produced in your life more than once, you have a strategy for. You have one problem, though. Most of your strategies are unconscious. So you don't know how you do it. You have a strategy, but you don't know how you do it. So what you do is you hope that something in the environment will trigger it and it will happen. Now, four reasons to master strategies. Number one reason. When you master strategies, you can now consistently produce any result you've done in the past. So what it allows you to do is duplicate any result you've ever done in your entire life. So if you think of anything you've done that you really like, like maybe you felt really attracted or really creative or really motivated or really in love, I don't know what it is. But anytime you've really felt that, you can now fire off that creativity at will, fire off that feeling of love at will, fire off that decisiveness at will. So there is no question you know you can do that for the rest of your life. That's the first reason you want to master strategies, consistency. Second reason you want to master strategies is it can help you to help anyone else you know to consistently get a result. See, once you know how to do this for yourself, you can also do it for somebody else. So if you have a friend, you've seen her before, like totally on fire, driven, excited to do something, and now she is absolutely depressed and bored, you can help her find out what she does when she's really driven, and you can trigger that strategy for her and show her how she can trigger it for herself for the rest of her life so she never has to go through that again. Third reason to master strategies is to manage someone else. To manage someone else. See, if you work for me and I know your motivation strategy, instead of trying to motivate you the way I'd be motivated, which works for me and maybe not for you, I'll know what really motivates you and I can get you to want to do something, not have to do something. It's a big difference. Like, for example, would you like to be able to get your kids to want to clean their room? You say, Tony, if you can explain that today, you are God. <laughs> okay? We're going to show you. you. The reason you're not getting through and getting motivated is you're trying to motivate them using your strategy. You're not doing it with their strategy. That's why it doesn't work. So once you understand strategies, you can elicit someone else's and use it to manage them effectively. And then the fourth reason to master strategies is because mastering strategies offers you really a way to model people. 
So if someone is outstanding, they're really, really good at something. Let's say Jason here can laugh at a drop of a hat and have fun. And you're serious as a heart attack. And you go, but I, I just don't think anything's funny. You could model Jason's strategy. You're getting himself in that plate where he la- place where he laughs so easily and you'll find yourself laughing. Or if, you know, John over here is unbelievably effective at making powerful decisions and you can't make a decision what to have for dinner, you can model John's strategy and apply it and all of a sudden you can make the same kind of quality of decisions. So strategies allow you to model as well. So number one, helps you get a consistent result. Two, help anybody else get a consistent result for themselves. Number three, chance to manage people effectively. Number four, chance to model. What if I told you that I personally know John the Baker? John the Baker, yeah. John has spent 25 years of his life to develop the ultimate chocolate cake. I know him personally. Now, the question I have for you is this. John has spent 25 years of his life to develop this ultimate chocolate cake. No one makes better better chocolate cake in the world than John, the baker. The question is this. Can you and I, amateur bakers that we are, produce the same quality chocolate cake as John the baker, even though we don't have 25 years of experience? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. How? By what? Do that again. (laughs) How? That's right, by his recipe, which is also known as his, his strategy. So now you know what strategies are. Strategies just like recipes. And since you know that metaphor, you already know most of there is to know about what a strategy is. Let's see, what does a recipe really do? It guarantees us that we can consistently produce a target state. Isn't that right? Like a specific quality of cake. Let's say that's the result. And so what it does is it tells us how to get that, and what it does is it gives us a set of what to start with? What's the first thing it tells us? Ingredients. So it tells us what ingredients to use, what specific ones, how much, what order, et cetera, to get this result. How often can you get this result when you know the recipe? How often? Every time. So the, the result, the chocolate cake we're gonna go after, the recipe of, for chocolate cake we're after is called motivation, let's say. We have to find out exactly what you do to consistently get motivated. And it is as consistent as a recipe for chocolate cake. Or what is your recipe for falling in love? Many of you fall in love, but you don't know what happens. Or you have people you want to fall in love with you and you don't know their strategy and you really love them, but you're communicating in a way that doesn't meet their strategy so they don't feel it. So we want to be able to find out anyone's strategy, but first of all, our own to start with. So if John the Baker gave me his recipe, the first thing the recipe would tell me is what are the what? Ingredients. Now, are there unlimited like elements that could go into some form of baking? Yeah, virtually unlimited, right? So, so you don't become overwhelmed. Years ago, bakers, people in the food business, came up with a way to take all these zillions of items and kind of group together the ones that relate to each other so they could think of them in smaller terms. And what that's called is chunking, chunking things together. And they created what's called the five basic food groups. So even though there might be almost unlimited types of foods, they all fit in one of those five groups, right? So that helps you not become overwhelmed. So you know that whatever John's recipe is gonna give you, it's gonna come out of one or more of those five groups, right? Well, in human recipes, in human strategies, there's only five types of ingredients as well. Lots of individual ones, but only five big groups. And those are, there are visual ingredients. What other kind of ingredients are there? Auditory ingredients. What else? Kinesthetic ingredients, which is sensations, right? Emotions, feelings. Olfactory ingredients, which are what again? Smell and gustatory, which is taste. So we know, for example, to get motivated, as an example, an emotional state called motivation is the result of cooking the right ingredients in the right amounts in the right order and sequence. How many follow this? Say I. Now, we could take these giant groups and make them a little bit more specific by saying there's two giant groups of visual ingredients. There are visual with a small e, which means visual external ingredients, or their visual internal eye ingredients. So those are, we can subset these two, you follow me? So for example, 
if you were to look up now and see me standing here, as you look at my body or see my face or just see me standing in this place, you're having a visual external or internal experience. Which one? External. If you close your eyes and picture me in your mind without looking outside, that's visual internal experience, okay? Similarly, you can have an auditory external experience or an auditory internal experience in terms of ingredients. So if you're listening to me right now as I'm saying what I'm saying in this moment, you're having an auditory external experience. If you remember something I said yesterday or five minutes ago in your head and you hear it, that's an auditory internal experience. If you say something out loud to me, that's an example of auditory. If you say something in your head but don't speak it aloud, that's auditory internal. You can have a kinesthetic external experience or you can have kinesthetic internal experiences, either one. Now, by the way, I pause on this one because a lot of people get confused when we start to do these. And let, let me give you a quick idea of what I'm talking about here. If I come along here and I walk up to somebody here and I walk up to this lady and I reach over and I touch her face like this, if she goes, oh, I hate that, or ooh, that feels good, those are emotional responses to a touch. Emotions are internal, right? They're deep inside of you. You may express them outside, but you experience them inside. If I reach over here and I touch her face like this, and she has no feeling about it, her, she, her brain just goes, oh, I was touched. You know, her skin, note, her muscles just note that there was a message. In that case, it's kinesthetic external because the musculature is on the outside. My moving towards her, my physical movement towards her is an example of kinesthetic external. The feeling I'm having as I move towards her, good, bad, or indifferent, is kinesthetic. If I touch her like this and she slaps me, the slap would be kinesthetic. How I felt about it would be kinesthetic. Great, you got it. Same thing can be true for olfactory. You can have an olfactory external, olfactory internal. You can smell something right now, external, or you can remember the smell of grandma's apple pie. And the same thing is true with gustatory, external, or internal. You can taste something right now or you can remember the taste. By the way, I should tell you that if you overeat on a regular basis, one of the reasons you overeat is you're not actually tasting your food, you are tasting the memory of past food. You're having a gustatory internal experience. What happens is you get something, you've had a lot of good feeling from in the past, you go to eat or you're stressed especially you go to eat and as soon as you see the food, it triggers the hypnosis and you go into the state of that. And so you keep eating because you actually aren't feeling what's going on now. You're not feeling and tasting the sensations of now. You're tasting the memories. And so since you're not connected to your body in the present, you keep eating to keep triggering the memory. So it's an interesting process. So oftentimes it's so easy to change someone's overeating pattern just by taking them out of gustatory internal and putting them in gustatory external, where now they actually become associated to what's really going on. So these are the five ingredients. We, most of us know these as the five senses, right? But there are two other words that are used for these. So when I use them, you'll know what they are and you won't be confused. They're also known as the five representational systems. That's a big word, but it just means that anything happens in the world, the only way you know what happens is these five senses represent to you what just happened, right? Visually, you get a representation. Or another word for that is representation. So a representation of what you just saw or heard or felt through your five senses. So if I said, what representational system is this person using right now? You might say they're in visual, right? A short for that is we might say rep system, which is just short for representational system. The other word that's used to describe these five senses or these five ingredients is the word modality. Modality or mode. So if I said, what modality is that person? And you might say they're using visual modalities right now or they're in a kinesthetic mode or modality, okay? So whether I say senses, ingredients, modalities, rep system, representational system, your brain will just nod and go, yep, I'm smart. I know what that means, right? Modality just means one of the five senses, all right? Now, if John the Baker gave me his recipe and it gave me the ingredients, but that was it, it said, use some flour, right? Use some chocolate, use some milk, are you going to be able to make the same quality of chocolate cake as John the Baker, yes or no? No. So we need to know more than just the ingredients. What's the second thing we've got to know? Tell me. That's right. We need to know the amounts and the qualities. 
What are going to be the amounts and qualities of each of these ingredients? Do we use six gallons or two teaspoons? Do we use, you know, normal milk or do we use low fat or do we use buttermilk? Right? We use the same ingredient, but a different quality of it is going to create a very different chocolate cake. So if you and I are using, let's say, motivation as our strategy, and you said, Tony, I made a picture to get motivated, I need to know the amounts and qualities. Was it moving or was it still, as an example? Would that change how you feel about it? Yes or no? Yes or no? A little or a lot? Okay. So the word that we we'll use to describe these more specific descriptions of a mode right, where you describe, let's say, the picture with more detail, amounts and qualities, it's called sub-modalities. These are called modalities. So these detailed descriptions are called sub-modalities. So a visual sub-modality might be, a way of measuring visual might be, let's say, for example, whether it's in color or black and white, whether it's moving or still. If you change those submodalities, will you get a different chocolate cake? You bet. What are some other examples of visual submodalities? Tell me. Is it close or is it far? Good. Is it bright or is it dim or dark? What other visual submodalities besides brightness, color, moving still, close, far? If the image is really big, really small, what else? Is it focused or is it defocused? Makes a big difference. Okay, someone said the speed of the movement. Is it moving slow or fast? How about the direction of the movement? Does that make any difference? What if you imagine watching a monster movie and the monster's coming at you like this? Does that feel different if the monster's going? Or if the monster's going? Does it feel different in your body? You bet it does. Okay, so direction and speed of movement, close or far, moving is still. How about whether you're in the picture or watching? Does that change how you feel? Yeah, that's called whether you're associated or disassociated, in the picture or if you're watching it. What are some other visuals? Well, someone said feeling. Feeling is not that. You may see something and get a feeling, but that feeling is not a visual submodality. Well, another one is it two-dimensional or three-dimensional, right? Give me some examples of some auditory submodalities. Give me some auditory submodalities. Okay, volume, how loud it is, tone, pitch, what else? Timbre, which is the quality of the sound, tempo, the speed of the sound, rhythm, okay, harmony, if it sounds like harmony or cacophony, clarity or lack thereof, the number of sounds, Sequence of sounds, what else? Emphasis, which sounds are emphasized most? Okay, speed is tempo. How about location of a sound? Would that change how you feel about it? Oh yeah. If you heard a sound and that sound was bump bump, bump bump, bump bump, bump bump, and you heard that sound, it was off in the distance over there, would that feel different than if it was right behind your head? Or what if it was in your own chest? Right, you start going, aliens, right? right? All that process, location makes a difference. And sound has a direction very often. So if you hear an ambulance and you hear it like this, say when you think it's approaching, it has a different effect than when you think it's leaving you, as an example. Okay? Give me some examples of kinesthetic submodalities. How many realize this ain't algebra, baby, at this stage? Say I. <laughs> This is the secret to turning on any emotions you want at will. That's what this is. Weight, temperature, texture, pressure, tension, rigid or flexible, something changing size you can feel or shape, throbbing, moisture, breathing, movement, location. How about another one? How about duration? Some things, right? Some things feel good for a short time, but not for a long time. Some things feel good for a long time, but not for a short time, right? So duration is also important. Now, some people say, well, what about pain? Isn't pain a submodality? No, pain is a chocolate cake, right? With tuna, <laughs> right? No, what pain is a result. When you have pain, it's because of what you're focusing on. Have you ever cut yourself, for example, not feeling any pain at all until you notice, well, oh my God, I'm cut, and then you got the pain? How many of you have had that experience? Say, I. 
It's because for your pain, you have to have a visual set of sub modalities for you. Or have you ever been in major pain and then something caught your attention and you focused on that? And while you're focusing on that, you focused on a different set of submodalities and you had no pain during that time. How many experienced that? Say I. So pain is a strategy. Now you may be not be setting it off consciously, but it's a strategy. And by the way, pain will happen automatically to signal to you something's wrong. But sometimes you know it's wrong and you correct it, but you keep feeling the pain. And the reason is because you keep running the strategy. Well, let's finish figuring out what it is we got to know to know strategies. If we go to John the Baker, he's got to tell us his ingredients, and he's got to tell us the amounts and qualities. Is there anything else he's got to tell us? Yes or no? Yeah, he's got to tell us the order and sequence, right? Because even if you the right ingredients, put them in the wrong order and sequence, you won't get the same quality of chocolate cake. Same thing's true with a telephone number. You know somebody's number dialed in the wrong order, you're not going to reach them. You know the keys to a vault, the, the numbers to the vault, put them in the wrong order, it doesn't work. So you have a sequence for being motivated, for example. Some of you see something, and then you say something to yourself, and that gives you a feeling called motivated. Others of you say something to yourself, and then you get a feeling, and you say, I'm motivated, and you're motivated at that point. And sometimes people use more than three. You know, they use those three, and they recycle them to get motivated. So there is a sequence that's very important. And by the way, the order and sequence, we also call the syntax. It's like if I said, the dog bit Johnny. You all know what that is, right? But what if I said, Johnny bit the dog? Same exact ingredients, different sequence, very different experience, especially if you're Johnny, right? So sequence is called syntax also. For short, we say order and sequence is the syntax. So you got to know the ingredients, the amounts and qualities, and the syntax, the order and sequence they need to go into. And then the fourth thing is, you got to be able to know how John cooked it. Meaning, you can have the same ingredients, right? Same order and sequence of those ingredients, same amounts and qualities. But if you cook yours, he cooks his at 700 degrees, 675, and you cook yours at 50 degrees, are you going to get the same result? Obviously not. Well, what does that have to do with the human being strategy? Well, if you make the same picture, like watch this. Let's say I told you the way I motivate myself is to make a big, bright picture that's very close. And then I say to myself, let's do it in a certain tone of voice. And then I get this feeling that motivates me. But this is how you do it. You do, you do the right ingredients, the right tonality, right everything, but you do it in this physiology because the physiology is your oven. The way you use your physiology cooks it. So if I say make a bright picture and you make a bright picture like this, is that going to produce the same kind of bright pictures if you do it like this? Yes or no? No, this is cooking at 675. This is cooking at 50. So there are four elements to strategies. You got to know the ingredients. What did they actually do? You got to know, secondly, the amounts and qualities. Like, did they make a picture? Did they bring it close, far, big? Did they say, I hate this, I love this? Did they say it fast? They go, I love this. They say it slow, I love this. How do they do it? Right? And then, most importantly, what's the sequence of it? What did they do first, second, third? And then lastly, what was their physiology like when they were doing it and for how long? They didn't cook it for 50 you know, years. They cooked it for a certain period of time with a certain intensity. Okay? How many follow this? Say, I. So you might say, okay, Tony, that's great, but how do I actually get somebody's strategy? What if I go to John the Baker and I say, John, give me your strategy, give me your recipe, and he says, no. Or worse, what if he says, I'd love to give it to you, but I don't know what it is. Is it possible for someone to get results without knowing how they do it? Yes, there's a term for it. We call it unconscious competence, where someone is competent, but they're unconscious about how they do it. Right? They're just kind of getting state. So if John said, I'd really love to give it to you, Tony, but I don't have the recipe. I just do a pinch of this, a dash of that. I'm not quite sure how I do it. Would you just give up and say he's a genius and you could never get the same quality chocolate cake? Yes or no? If you were totally committed to getting John's recipe, what would you do? That's right. You'd put the cook in the kitchen, you'd watch what he did, and you'd record it, and then you'd see, did I do it right? By saying, okay, now let me tell you what to do, and you have him do it and see if it works. 
Same thing. So step one to getting someone's strategy, your own or someone else, we call put the cook in the kitchen, which means get either catch the person while they're in state doing something and see how they're doing it or put them in state. How can you put somebody in state? Get them to remember a time and actually get them in that memory and actually relive it. There's a word for that. When you have someone step into experience, we call it being fully associated. So you put the cook in the kitchen, you get them fully associated. So we use the cook metaphor, say, okay, John, come to the kitchen. When John gets in the kitchen, he gets in what? And as he's in state, he gets fully associated. So he goes, oh yeah, I know. And he reaches over here to grab this and he's about to throw it in the bowl and you go, stop. What do you got there? Because you want to know what ingredient it is, right? And you see it's flour. You want to know the amounts and quality. So you go, okay, let's measure it. It's four cups and the quality is grade AAA wheat flour. Okay, boom, drop it in. Now there's a problem. You knocked him out of, because you broke his. So you got to put him back in. So this is what you do with a person too. You say, okay, John, remember where you were. Okay, you're here in the room, right? You're here in the kitchen, right? You reached over, got a handful of flour. And he goes, oh yeah. And he's back in what? State, fully what? Associated. You ask him, how's it feel? Where are you? Okay, I'm there. Okay, great. Boom, he reaches something else. He's about to throw it in. You go, stop. What is that? You open his hand, you notice the second ingredient is chocolate. You notice number two in the sequence, right? You find out what's the amount. It's six pounds of chocolate, right? And it's dark chocolate, right? Great AAA chocolate, right? And so he puts that in, and as soon as he puts it in, you knocked him out of what? State. So you got to put him back in where he gets fully so you ask him questions, say, John, remember you described to him, you get to remember, remember where you are, John, here you are, reach over the flower, chalk, he goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. He grabs something else, about to throw it in. He goes, stop, what is it? You see the third ingredient, it's tuna. <laughs> Think of chocolate cake right now. Think of chocolate. Chocolate, chocolate. <laughs> Just providing you with some new choices of imagery if you would like to change your association to chocolate cake. You continue with this until John is done and then you see how he cooks in his oven. Now, how do you know if you have someone's strategy? Simple. You put the cook in the kitchen and you say, John, now I'm going to tell you what to do. Get four cups of grade A wheat flour. Okay, go get the chocolate. Go get the tuna, go get that. And you do the whole thing. Cook it at 75 degrees, at 375 or 675, whatever it is. Now let's taste it. Is the texture the same? Is the moisture the same? Wow, we got it. If you don't got it, you missed something. So you go back and do it again. Now in the beginning, you're not good at this stuff, right? Because you're new. And so, you know, you don't do it perfectly and maybe you got to work at it a little bit. But would it be worth spending even an hour, an hour just to find out a person's motivation strategy like your own? or decision strategy or creativity strategy, why would it be worth even a total hour of focus? Because once you got it, how long can you use it for? For the whole, your whole life, and it won't take you an hour. It'll take you 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes max, even when you're new. When you get good, you'll start noticing strategies on the fly as they're happening. Because you're no longer in the dark. It's gonna start showing up for you, right? You'll start to notice people mirroring. You're gonna start noticing things you never noticed before. So strategies are the same way. So you can get somebody's motivation strategy by saying, okay, can you remember a time when you're totally motivated? And they go, yep. Are they fully associated? So say, can you remember a specific time? And they go, yeah. Say, so go back that time. Imagine you're there. How are you breathing when you're really motivated? I don't know. Well, if you did know. Well, I know. Like this sort of. Okay, boom. You're trying to get there. What were you picturing? What were you seeing? Now they're there. What was the very first thing that caused you to be motivated? Let's say, for example, you say, okay, Tony, what am I supposed to do? Let's say I want someone's attraction strategy. What do I do? Walk up in a bar, walk up to some girl and go, hey, baby, what's your attraction strategy? What do you picture? Right. No, you don't even have to do this. After a while, you'll start hearing it. Like recently, I, I, was, I went to lunch at my office in San Diego and I came back and used, instead of using the elevator, I decided to use the stairs. You know, why not? So the stairs, they'll lead up to the back of the building and they come up into our lunchroom area. So I came through there and I got paged and I picked up the phone to take the call. 
As I'm on the phone in the lunchroom, I hear four or five of our secretaries in there who have our lunch, and one of them, two of them or three of them just came back from lunch, and they are in a very animated state. And they're talking really loud, and they're giggling like crazy, and I'm at a hard time even hearing the call. So as I'm trying to talk to this person, I'm also hearing out of my other ear this conversation, which is unmistakable. This woman's saying, oh my God, Mary. Mary, oh my God, you missed it. You should have gone to lunch. I'm telling you something. There was this guy there, oh my God. The minute I saw him, he was tall, and he was dark, and he's handsome. And he looked at us out of the corner of his eye. And as soon as I saw him, I thought, oh, I gotta have him. Okay. okay, so now, guess what? I know her entire attraction strategy. What's the first trigger, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic? Visual, what are the submodalities? Tall, dark, handsome. How do you look at her? Corner of his eye. The way you look is a submodality. You can look straight, you look corner, you can look at an angle, all kinds of things you can do, right? So I know all those. Do I know what the second one? What was the second element? Was it auditory or kinesthetic? Uh, kinesthetic. And if you're not sure what it was, just go, uh, feel what muscles you use, you'll know, okay? And then the third one was what? What was the third element of her strategy? Auditory. She said, I gotta have him, right? So here's her strategy if I was gonna write it out. It's visual, external, you guys see that? Then it was kinesthetic internal, a feeling she felt. Then it was auditory, and I don't know if it was external or internal, because she probably said, I'm gonna have him in her head. I doubt if she said it out loud. So I'll say internal, but maybe she did, <laughs> okay? And we even know the submodalities. We know that this guy was large, tall, right? So it's a large image. She didn't think of him as small. We know that he was dark, which was part of her submodality she likes and he looked out of the corner of her eye, and I think she said he smiled at her, right? So we know her submodalities. Kinesthetic, uh, however you spell that, <laughs> okay? But uh, you go, what is that? Okay, there's tension. Is there tension in that, yes or no? Is there pressure, right? Where is it? Stomach area, maybe some other areas. And then the auditory, I've gotta have him. And by the way, that's the words, I gotta have him. But did she say, I've got to have him? No. Was there a speed? Was there a tempo? Fast or slow? Fast. Loud or quiet? Dropping down or going up at the end? So we know even all this, we know the whole thing. Now I can, I can cause her to feel attracted to anybody or I could show any man how to trigger her. Go, what if he's not, not tall and dark? I'll show you that's not even an obstacle. You can still trigger it as long as you trigger it in these sequences and use some of these submodalities, right? So you're gonna start noticing somebody say, oh yeah, I just bought this watch. Find out their decision-making strategy. Oh yeah, where'd you get it? Oh, at the store, what made you want it? I don't know, I just walked in the room because a friend of mine told me they had great stuff there. And she told me, she steered me well in the past. What's the first part of their strategy? Auditory, external. The first motivation is someone telling them. And then I walked in and I talked to the, the jeweler and asked him if it really was everything they said it was. So what's the second part? Auditory, external. Then what happened? I took one look out of it and said to myself, third part is look, and then again, said, here's somebody who's very auditory. This really is beautiful, and it felt right, so I just bought it. What's her strategy? A, A, right? Someone told her, auditory external, she talked to the guy, visual external, she saw it. She said to herself, auditory internal, wow, this is really great, and then kinesthetic internal felt right. That's her strategy. You wouldn't go to her and say, let me show you this watch. You'd first tell her about it. You describe it to her, you tell her things. That'll get her much more motivated, okay? That's visual, auditory, kinesthetic. See it, right? Say it, feel it. So what most people do is they try to motivate other people using their strategy rather than using that person's strategy. Let's say you go to a restaurant and you see someone there or you meet somebody there or you'd like to meet somebody there and you think they're really attractive, you'd like to get to know them. Would you just walk up and say, I wanna know your attraction strategy? Obviously not. So can you get rapport with someone from a distance while you're not anywhere near their space, even without speaking to them? Is that possible, yes or no? How would you do that? You'd mirror the person. Do you have to be looking at them to get rapport with them, yes or no? No, absolutely not. So let's say I wanna get rapport, I'm looking this direction, and I wanna get rapport with someone over here I'm not looking at. Can you do that? Sure, all you have to do is take, pick eye contact. Let me pick this lady on the aisle. What's your name, my dear? Diane? So if I look at Diane here, Diane is sitting kind of a unique way, like this. So that might be awkward, so I probably wouldn't mirror that part. I might mirror part of it like this, so I'm in that, but not exactly. I don't have to mirror it exactly. It's not like knowing her thoughts. I don't have to know that. Or I could just mirror her breathing pattern. That's it, so I could do that. Or I could mirror her facial expression. 
Now, I would never do it looking at her. I glance at her, see where she is, and then I continue my conversation with whoever I was there with, and I just keep mirroring. Maybe the breathing, because it's the most subtle one of all. She won't even notice it. But after a while, she'll start to feel like she's in sync with me. So as I'm looking over here, what if at the same time I'm doing that, I see somebody else over here I want to get rapport with? Can you get rapport with more than one person at a time? What if you're in a business meeting? Can you do that, yes or no? Sure, I can mirror her leg position, overall angle, and maybe her breathing, and maybe I think this lady's like head position, right? And her little smile, like this, right? So now I got rapport with two people simultaneously. See, when two people meet, if there's rapport, if there's mutual respect, mutual caring, if the person doesn't feel you're trying to manipulate them, and you really do care, when two people meet, if that rapport is there, whoever is most certain will eventually influence the other person. Period. Period. I'll give you a corn example. Columbus. How does he get the queen to give him all these ships to go on a trip that no one comes back from? Or better yet, how does he recruit people to go on a trip no one ever survives? Because when he met these people, his vision, his certainty was greater than their uncertainty. Now, if you know the story of Columbus, the real story, about halfway across the ocean, these guys started freaking out because they started going, he doesn't know where we're going. It's not like he has a map. We're all going to die. Kill him. And they were going to kill him. And one guy said, don't kill him. He's the only one certain we're going to find land. <laughs> and he was. That's leadership. I'll give you a, a fun example. Michael Eisner is a friend of mine. Brilliant man. What he's done with Disney is unbelievable. And so I got a chance to fly with him. We went to a hockey game together, a Stanley Cup championship, and then we flew back together. And I asked him, I said, I heard this story about Disney. I said, I wonder if it's true. And he said it was, because a lot of things are urban legends, you know. And the story is this. I said, I'd heard that when they opened Epcot down in Florida, that what happened was um, a reporter came. First of all, it was really successful, obviously. Huge success. Opening day. And all these reporters were covering things. And one reporter was a real jerk, approached Roy Disney, Walt's brother. And he said to Roy, he said, Roy, this must be a real bittersweet day for you, huh? And Roy looked at him incredulous. He said, what, what do you mean, a bittersweet day? I mean, Epcot's open, it's magnificent, everybody loves it. He said, yeah, Epcot's magnificent, it's beautiful, but it's got to really hurt you to know that Walt never got to see this. What a scumbag. Right? But Roy was so cool, such a class act. He looked at the guy and he smiled and he said, gosh, it's obvious to me why you're merely a reporter and not a visionary. Yeah. He said, you're gonna always have to write about other people's achievements until you understand one principle. Walt saw this. That's why you get to see it. You can have so much certainty you can transfer it to others that can live beyond your lifetime. It is a precious commodity that few will ever exercise, but all have the key to. Everyone has the key to. Leadership is not born. It's a decision to lead and not follow, to believe and not doubt, to create and not destroy, to be a force for good or maybe a force for God. But to do that, you have to defy all your fears. You have to defy all the odds. And you've got to set a brand new standard for yourself and you've got to step up. And when you do that, you have a totally different experience in life. Totally different experience. In this state, there's so much you can achieve and do. So why wouldn't you stay here? I mean, how easy is it to get in this state? Heartbeat. So will you continuously? Some of you lost your certainty when I asked that question. Those of you who lost your certainty, what you did is you entertained another thought. You went, oh, I've done things before, now fall through. Oh, there must be some exception. You just created a different representation, so you went into a different state. But the answer is most of you would not keep this if we don't make another change. 
Because see, you could feel good all the time, you could feel attracted all the time, you could feel all the feelings you want all the time, but the only reason you don't is not because you can't, it's because you don't. And the reason you don't is you have a set of beliefs about what it's appropriate to feel or to think or to experience. So it's the appropriateness that is the real limit, it's not the capability. So as long as you have a bunch of rules, a set of beliefs, they're basically rules, that you really never thought through in detail. Your rules are reactions to your past. You had pain, you make up a rule so you won't feel that pain again. Or you see somebody else and you model them. They may not have been a very good model, but you modeled their rules. And now you find yourself in a box where there's only so many things you can do and most things you can't do and you wonder why you're unhappy. Most of us start out as a kid where there are no rules. You do anything you want, you can express what you felt, you can think what you think, you love who you want to love, you can do whatever you want to do, and then you gradually enter society where the door got smaller and the room got smaller, and all of a sudden there are consequences for everything, and all of a sudden pretty soon you stop living. So what we have to be able to do for you to have what you really want is we've got to dig out those beliefs that are keeping you from having what you want. And there are all kinds of weird beliefs we have. Where intellectually we know better, right? But emotionally they still control us. Like, oh, you know, gosh, you know, if you know, I'm really successful, then people will resent me and they won't love me and then I will lose all those good feelings. So I'll only succeed so much. Or if you're a woman and you're successful, pff, men can't handle it, so you can't have a relationship and be successful. You know, or if you're black, or if you're brown, or if you're Indian, or if you're white, then people respond to you X way, and that's just how it is. And there's plenty of references to back up all these things, aren't there? There's plenty of racism in the world. There's plenty of men who do respond to women that way. There are plenty of situations where when you're successful, you're rejected. So then we generalize that that's everything because we don't want to ever go through that. But as soon as we close that door, we close all of it that we really want. It's just fear that we made those beliefs out of. And what we have to be able to do is step up as leaders. The leaders don't, they're not treated fairly, right? They're not treated nicely of any color, of any gender, of any background doesn't matter who it is, but they lead. And out of that, they have a life that's quite extraordinary. It has ups and downs, but it is unbelievably rewarding. It is not a very safe life. If you want safety, you say, I want safety, you want security, then go to prison. But if you want freedom, you have to step up. And the biggest freedom you need is to free yourself from the slavery we all have done to ourselves through the belief structures that we've developed. There's more than enough obstacles in the outside world for you not to add to them by adding some in your head. And the worst ones are the ones that you make totally certain in your mind that you believe they're true. Intellectually you know better maybe, but gut believe they're true. So we must destroy, not deal with, we must destroy those beliefs, destroy them. In order to do that, we gotta remember what is a belief? It's a feeling of absolute what? Oh my God, the very thing that I want over here. No wonder you live by those beliefs because you're in this state when you think about them. Maybe it's a sick feeling of certainty, like you're certain it's gonna be terrible, but it's still certainty, isn't it? That's why you respond to it. And you probably have put so many legs under your belief now, it's really solid. So the only way to uproot that is if we link massive, unbearable, immediate levels of to it in a real way, in our gut. If we do that, it'll dislodge it. It'll give us the what? And it'll interrupt our? And then we have room to create a new set of beliefs that'll empower us, which we will anchor with the most massive, immediate levels of pleasure that you've ever felt before. And when that happens, your whole life changes because beliefs, all human behavior is belief driven. Even if you're not aware of it consciously, you're doing things because of what you believe it's gonna lead to. It's gonna to lead to more certainty, remember those six needs? Or it'll give you the variety, a surprise, or it'll give you connection that you so desperately want, or it'll make you feel significant. Even if it's a bad way, it still feels significant. Or it'll make you grow, it'll make you contribute. So beliefs control it all. If we take care of the belief, we take care of the root of it all. If we just work on the behavior, you can change the behavior and if you have the same belief, you'll just find some other behavior that's just as bad.
Many years ago, some of you know a little bit about my story, but many years ago I had succeeded by what I thought were great standards. And I thought I knew a lot about human behavior and things are going really well. And as my business grew, I never wanted to be a businessman. I never got into business to do business. I was more like an artist and my work was people. You know, and I worked, sculpt, help people sculpt their souls, teamwork with them to make that happen was my vision of what I did. And I had a lot of skills at a very young age. And then here I was, this artist, and then I realized to do your art, you have to go to art shows, and you got to set up the shows, and you got to hire people to build things and do things. And so I kind of got in business ad hoc. Never studied business, never had that in my focus. It just changed people's lives. And so because my skill was good, my business grew. But I had no business skill because I wasn't focused on that. And so I realized I had problems in that area, so I hired some people, and that was tough finding the right people. Many of you own your own businesses know how difficult that is initially. And then I finally got some people to be partners with me who I thought I really could count on. And I made them a deal. I said, look, I'm the best in the world at what I do, and I'm humble about it. I need somebody who's the best in the world at what they do. And I said, I want to be able to do what I do best. You do the rest. And they said, that's perfect. This is our skill. And we made a deal because I was already doing very well at that point. So I'd earn X amount. I do so much business. I said, here's my goal. My goal is to impact even more people than I do now but to do just as well, or obviously, hopefully better financially, so that I'm home with my kids, because at that point I was on the road almost 200 days a year. And they agreed to do that, and they would get a percentage of my profit beyond that. Well, long story shortened, I woke up a year and a half later, and I had a lot more people in my seminars, and I was reaching a lot more people, and I was doing my best work ever. But I was also on the road now 275 days a year, because their thing was supposed to give me bigger seminars, fewer of them, so I could be at home. That wasn't happening. I was doing more events, way more events, a lot more people, and then in spite of all that, at least my saving grace for me was, wow, look at all the people's lives I'm having a chance to interact with and impact. And I came home and found out that I was $758,000 in debt. Not when my company was doing $50 million, when my company was doing like $3 million. So that was a huge amount of money. And I didn't have any way to figure out how I could pay it off. And then I found out one of them had embezzled a quarter of a million dollars. One of my partners, one of my good friends. And I was so hurt by that, I can't even tell you. And, you know, everybody told me to go bankrupt, but I refused to do that because I have a belief that says, even if someone else did it to you, I'm still responsible to the other vendors, regardless of what someone else did to me, right? So, um, so I, to me, bankruptcy was just didn't have integrity in it. Even though it looked like there was no way to do it, I said, I have to find a way. It's a must, not a should. And if you give yourself that escape route of bankruptcy, people will take it. I didn't give myself that escape route. And so I figured out how to turn around. A year later, I turned everything, paid everything off miraculously oh, after going on the road for about 310 days. It was unbelievably intense. And, you know, my intensity the whole time for that many days, to give you perspective, and traveling, et cetera, et cetera. So, but in the midst of all that, I had to look at my life and go, you think you're so smart, Robbins, and that you know so much about human behavior, but you didn't predict these guys stealing your money. You know, so maybe you're not as smart as you think you are. And it made me reevaluate things. And I flew to Fiji... I didn't own a resort there yet, but it's always been the place I've gone to escape and think and create. And I remember I was so angry and I kept asking really empowering questions like, how do I kill these people and, you know, things like that. And for some reason that wasn't going in the right direction, so I got better and I started saying, what really makes people do what they do? What really makes us do what we do? And as I asked those questions, I found myself in a place where one morning I woke up in Fiji about 7.30 in the morning, and I was like, I don't know if you had that experience, but stuff just starts coming through you, you know? And I grabbed my journal, I started writing like crazy, and I sat down in this thing called a bure, this main bure, and people came in, because I wrote from 7.30 in the morning till about 7.30 at night, 7.15 at night, and I took one short break for lunch. And I mean, I wasn't like thinking or writing, it was like writing like this as fast as I could. I filled two journals. And my arm was all crunched up, my fingers were crunched up at the end of the day. But at the end of that, I had created what I call destiny technologies. I couldn't read any of it, but I had created it all. <laughs> and I was on fire. And I then took these principles and I did them to myself, which made the most radical change of my entire life. I mean, it was the gift that came out of that experience that seems to be so, so terrible, was taking my life to another level. And I thought my life was extraordinary. You know, I thought it was really a phenomenal life. So, but I got to feel a different level that I'd never felt before as a result of this. And when I came home, my staff, people come up to me and say, what happened to you? And I'd say, what do you mean? Because I didn't tell anybody what had happened. And they, just, they saw me, they said, you just, you just seem so centered. You know, you seem so happy, you seem so strong. I said, well, aren't I always centered and happy? And he said, well, most of the time, you know. And what was different was this shift in me. 
And what I learned and what came through me, I guess, at that time is a lot of things, but I can tell you the essence of it, and we're going to deal with part of it here. But what I learned really, or what came through me really, was that two things control your entire life. Two things control what you think about every moment, what you feel, what you do, what you wear, what you drive, what you say to people, how you react to injustice. And those two things are your beliefs and your values. That's it. I realized that everything we do to avoid pain or to gain pleasure, but two people can look at the same event. One person thinks it's pleasurable, one thinks it's painful. The difference is beliefs and values. What it is you believe about it, what you value in a situation makes you make different decisions than other people. And your decisions are what really shape your destiny more than anything else, more than the environment. It's not the conditions, it's the decisions that really shape you most, okay? So I'd like to give you an example. First, let's define what values are. You might want to jot this someplace in your notes. Values are really the emotional states that you and I believe are most important. Values are the emotional states that you believe are most important for you to either feel or to avoid. Now, if you value something and you want more of it, it's probably because you link to it a large level of what? Pleasure. If you value something that is you think it's important to avoid, it's probably because you think it leads to a lot of what? pain, okay? So you have two types of values, basically. You have those emotions you want more of. Think of them as twin targets. They're guiding all your decision-making, basically, okay? One target is the things you're trying to move towards, right? Those things you want. And the other target are things you're trying to move away from, you're trying to avoid. And every day you're making decisions, you're trying to decide, how can I get what I want and avoid what I don't want? Now, what's interesting is we all have different emotions that fit these categories. So on the towards list, for example, tell me if you would, just out loud, yell out some emotions you'd like to experience a lot more of. Okay, success, love, passion, security, adventure, Peace, joy, freedom. Okay, we'll stop there. So I got success, love, passion, security, adventure, peace, and freedom. Now, how many of you value all of these states, meaning they're all important to you as a person? Let me see your hands. Say I. But do you value them equally? No. That's why you will make a decision differently than the person sitting right next to you, even if they're like a good friend because we all have a different level of intensity of value based upon the way we've lived, the way we've been brought up. So which one of these is number one for you out of this list? Which do you value most? Success, love, passion, security, adventure, peace, or freedom? Okay, now, let's take an example. Let's say you got a person whose number one value is, let's say, adventure, and sitting next to them is a person whose number one value is security. Are these two people gonna make decisions the same way, yes or no? No, are these two people gonna to want to work in the same kind of environment? Are they gonna to wanna to live in the same kind of environment? Are they gonna to wanna to drive the same kind of car? Are they gonna to wanna to go on the same kind of vacation? Not even close, not even close. Because your values determine your direction. It's the most important thing to understand, they determine your direction. So these are radically different directions, radically different. What if these people are married? Does it happen, yes or no? Sure it does, you know why? Because when you meet somebody and you're attracted to them, you go first, before I get attracted, let me find out what your values list is and the order and hierarchy of them so I'm clear. Is that what you do? No, you get totally attracted, you fall head over heels and then you wake up one morning and go, who's this? How could you possibly think that way? That's insane, right? Because you fell in love with a package, you didn't know exactly what their value structures were, right? So this is the kind of thing that happens. What's more difficult even is when this is within you. See, what if a person's number one value in life is security? And I say to you, let's go skydiving. They're gonna do it, yes or no? No, unless they believe skydiving is totally secure. That's where beliefs come in. So you have values and you have beliefs about what has to happen to meet that value. How many follow that? Like rules, if you will, or beliefs about what's likely to happen. Like if you go skydiving, you're going to get killed. Well, if that's your belief and your number one value is security, no way. If you think skydiving is the most fun, exciting thing in the world and your number one value is adventure, you're there. How many fall? Okay. 
So this kind of tells you how that works. Now, we also have a list of emotions we're trying to avoid. Tell me some of the emotions you'd like to avoid feeling. Anger. Guilt. Rejection. Feeling like a failure. Feeling depressed. Feeling alone. Notice how quick you guys were to make this list. That didn't take any time at all for you guys to come up with this list. People are much more associated with what they don't want than what they do want. Now, out of this list, feeling angry, guilty, feeling rejected, feeling like a failure, feeling depressed, or feeling alone, how many of you would like to avoid all of these emotions if you could? Say, I. But are they all equally important to avoid? Are some more painful to you than others? So some you'll work harder to avoid than others. You're more motivated to avoid than others. So which one on this list would you work the hardest to avoid having to feel? Anger, guilt, rejection, failure, depression, or feeling alone or lonely? What happens though, let, let's take an example here. What happens if you got a person whose number one value in life is they want to be successful and the emotion they want to avoid um, against everything else in life is they don't ever want to be rejected? Anybody see a bit of a challenge here? You better believe it. What's the problem? In order to be successful, at least in cultural terms, must you risk rejection, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Now here's the kicker. People do more to avoid what? Pain than they'll ever do to gain. So if these are equal, like one's the top of your towards list, one's the top of your away from list, you'll do more to avoid this. So here's what you'll do. You'll work hard to succeed. You'll take three steps forward. And then as you do, you go, oh my God, I could get rejected. And you'll take four steps back. And then you'll call that self-sabotage. You're not sabotaging. You're simply following the rules that you've set up for your brain. It's just executing what you set up. Like, for example, when you become more successful, as you succeed, take, you have to risk rejection to succeed, right? Once you succeed, your chances of rejection increase or decrease with success? Increase geometrically. Why? Because when you succeed, many people look at you and that reminds them of what they've not done. And so in order to feel significant, they make you wrong. Like you must have done something or taken advantage or you're not honest or you're not whatever. Because if you're honest and good and everything else and you succeed in the why the nay is what they say to themselves. Now you may not judge them at all. You may think they're the greatest person in the world. They judge themselves. So they have to tear you down so they can still feel significant. So when you succeed, people don't even know you, never met you will judge you and have very strong opinions about you. Never spoken to you, know nothing about you whatsoever. It's all their fear coming out. So the bottom line is, when you got this, this person will what you call sabotage, what I would call follow instructions, right? So how many of you have found yourself taking two steps forward and three steps back at times? Let me see your hands. Say, I. Then I guarantee you, you have values that are in conflict. And unless you resolve these, you will continue to have this problem. You must solve this. Whether you feel successful or not is based on your beliefs about what has to happen to succeed. Are you capable of succeeding? What is success, right? So even if you have it up here, your beliefs will play a huge role in whether you feel it or not. Same thing with rejection. To be rejected, you have to have some rule that says, when this and this and this happens, then I feel rejected. Like, for example, how do you know when it's time to feel bad? How do you know? Someone said you subconsciously tell yourself, yeah, you have, not values, the values are the emotions you're after. The beliefs tell you when it's time to feel good or feel bad. So some people think they should feel bad when they should feel good. It's because they got some weird belief, right? So the beliefs really determine when you feel pain and when you feel pleasure. The values determine the direction of your life. So what's an anchor? An anchor is a created association. See, anchors are not inborn, right? This is something that we make up, we create, and it's very important to understand that because it means you can change them at will, and it'll change the way you think and feel. So an anchor is a created association, a created association between a specific trigger and a specific state. So an anchor is a created association between a specific trigger and a specific state. Okay? One more time, an anchor is a created, you're not born with it. It's a created association between a specific trigger and a specific state. So for example, 
the American flag is an anchor for most people in this room of some sort, right? Most of you have probably good feelings when you think about it for the most part. And so were you born with that? No, you learn to associate the stars and stripes to a set of feelings or emotions, maybe primarily pride, for example. But you had to learn that association. You were not born understanding what the golden arch has meant, but now you know. You were not born having certain phrases built into you, like if I said to most of you something like, uh, plop, plop, fizz, fizz. How do you spell relief? <laughs> you people are scary. <laughs> you know better. Okay, or if I said, Winston tastes good like A. Okay, good. So all those triggers, those are anchors. Advertisers understand the power of anchoring. That's what most commercials are. A commercial is an anchor. Now, how does an anchor occur? Let's take a look at that because I don't have to teach you how to anchor. I have to teach you that you are anchoring so you can do it consciously because some of you with good intent are actually creating negative anchors with yourself or people that you care about. So let's look at it creates an anchor. An anchor occurs anytime a person is in an intense state. So an intense state is one in which a person is fully what? Fully what? Outstanding. Outstanding. So is depression a fully associated state? Can it be a negative state, yes or no? Can you anchor in negative feelings? Can you anchor in positive feelings? Absolutely. So anytime somebody's in an intense state, positive or negative doesn't matter. All that matters is they're there, man. They're feeling it. They're fully associated. If, two key words here, if at the peak of that experience, if at the peak, someone's second key word consistently does anything unique, okay? So if someone's experiencing intense feelings, however they got there, you put them there, they were already there. But if once somebody's in an intense state, positive or negative, if while they're at the peak of that state, someone consistently does anything unique, a certain look they give you, right? Or a certain thing they say, or a certain touch, right? Like if I said to you, hmm, something to, okay, that's not an anchor, right? If you can't, then you, okay? So we've got some verbal anchors. I have some visual anchors with you guys, the way I look at you at certain times to trigger you. How many had a parent that had you anchored? Like if they said your full name, Anthony, you went, I know what that means. How many had one of those? Or they gave you a look and you were like, oh, ooh, 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 ooh. I mean, you knew what that meant, right? How many had a visual anchor from your parent, right? As soon as you saw that, you knew that that look was linked to a specific state because you'd had it happen before. So this is all that's happening. So what do advertisers do as a classic example? Well, the average commercial is how long on television? How long? 30 seconds and they sell you a product. Now, how do they do that? Do they go through in those 30 seconds and explain in detail how the product works, why it's superior, how they manufactured it, et cetera? Is that how they do it? Yes or no? No. See, the only way they do it, in fact, do most ads have anything to do with the product? Zero. They have nothing to do with the product. I mean, have you ever seen a Levi's 501 jean commercial? Do they have anything to do with the jeans? No, but how many of you at the end of it, no, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that sex happened nearby, no question. Because <laughs> they link that feeling to them. Or how about a beer commercial? What happens in a beer commercial? Do we get reality? Do we get two big fat guys with giant beer bellies, drunk as skunks, grab each other the head, pounding, vomiting, going, Ugh, love you little buddy. Ugh. No. What do we get? We get sex. Have you seen one of those Coors Light commercials, the new ones? The Coors Light commercial, the new one, starts with a camera zeroing on a woman who's unzipping her pants. That's how it starts. She rips it off and she's wearing a bikini underneath and she goes jogging on off. And the guy goes, give me a silver bullet. That's a hard one to figure out, isn't it? <laughs> right? Right? It's all about feeling and emotion. Old Milwaukee beer. Six old guys who haven't been in, you know, out for any work for some time are out fishing, hanging out. They open one little can of old Milwaukee beer and six blonde bombshells parachute in, right? Now, not everybody goes for sex. Some people say that disgusts me. I want family values. So the commercials that get you are the ones like McDonald's, the family place, right? McDonald's is the family place. McDonald's is the place you're supposed to go when you want to be close with your family. That's what they'd have you believe. Like, I really want to be close to my family, so let's go to McDonald's. Right, let's bring a candle, put it on the plastic tray, sit there and have a dinner together, right? McDonald's new phrase is, McDonald's makes your day. 
if McDonald's makes your day, you better go back to bed. <laughs> okay? But the bottom line is, it's all about, what do they do? They use imagery, a beer commercial, a jet goes by. What's a jet doing in a beer commercial? If he's drinking, we're all in trouble. But it puts you in what? So they use imagery, sounds, etc., to put you in a state, and then consistently at the peak of that state, they flash the mirror, they flash the item, they flash it, flash it, flash it, till later on you know better, but you buy it. Nike sells that if you wear these shoes, you'll be Michael Jordan. There's no difference between Nike shoes or anybody else's shoes. They're the same shoes. But the whole thing's based on an illusion that if you wear this, you will be anchored miraculously into peak performance, right? You're going to be peak performance if you're peak performance, not the shoes. And we know that intellectually, but they still anchor us. Now, this doesn't just happen in advertising, though. Where it really affects us most is where we live. So how does anchoring occur? Well, here's an example of a negative anchor. Let's say um, John's father just died. Is he likely to be in an intense state, yes or no? So in our culture, most of us consider someone passing on a great loss. So now he's in a deep state of depression or sadness. So while he's in this intense state, some well-meaning friends come by and they look at him so sad and they go, John, hang in there, buddy. Hang in there. So if one person goes up to John, like two people are there, and one goes, hang in there, John. Now he's in an extremely intense state and at the peak of that intensity, someone is doing something kind of unique. If that's not bad enough, the other person right next to him sees him and goes, yeah, John, hang in there, man. Same thing. What's happened? without realizing it, these two men have negatively anchored John. So now let's say 10 months have gone by. John's okay about his father passing away because after all, he was 132. He was beginning to stink. It was time to go. And um, he was okay about it now, okay? And he's really happy. And he goes to a party and he goes inside the party and somebody comes up to him and goes, hey, John, how's it going, bud? What happens within five seconds? Anybody know? He's totally depressed and he doesn't even know why. How many of you ever had this happen where you're doing fine, all of a sudden something happened. Pfft, you really had some real anger or real sadness or real hurt. How many of you ever had this experience? Say, I. You say, but Tony, no one touched me. Is touch the only kind of anchor? No, anchors can be smells. The most powerful anchor of all is smell. The reason is when you're a fetus is you're developing before your brain fully develops, your nose fully develops. It goes to the deepest part of the brain called the reptilian portion of the brain. So smells will put you in state faster than anything. But also it could be a piece of music in the background you're not noticing. But a while ago you heard that while you were in a certain state. And wham, man, now you're depressed and can't figure out why or sad or hurt or whatever the case may be. So anchoring's happening all the time. Anytime you're in an intense state, you're being anchored. Do you think there are any anchors potentially possibly for this weekend at all that may have been set? I've got you anchored so many ways so that I've picked anchors when you go into the world that I know will be naturally triggered by your environment. So the experiences you had here will start to show up automatically. Because if I just try and count on your intellect to do it, you're gonna get busy. But if I have loaded you, which I have, with a gazillion triggers, then all these things, whether it be songs, whether it be phrases, whether it be situations, whether it be things in your own physiology, will cause you to use this stuff again. The reason you're doing it is it's so anchored. But you want to do your own anchoring as well, okay? So that's what anchoring really is. Now you might say, well, Tony, what if I've got this negative anchor? How do I get rid of it? That's a good question. You're doing it by something we call collapsing an anchor, which I'm going to show you. But let me ask you a question first. Can you anchor yourself? Sure you can. All you have to do is put yourself in a total peak, what? And at the peak, consistently do anything unique. Use a sound, use a look, use a touch. You do it again and again and again at the peak. Then what do you do? Change your state and then test it. If you test it and it works, obviously it works. If you test it and it doesn't work, you were probably off on your timing. Like you really didn't do it at the peak. A lot of people say, well, how do I know when the peak is? You don't. You trust your unconscious. You do it too soon and too often and gradually your brain gets good at it, okay? Or if it didn't work, maybe you didn't get yourself fully in state. You gotta get fully associated in this. I'll give you a little description. Let's say I'm John and I got this negative anchor on my arm, okay? How do I get rid of it? I collapse the anchor. How do I collapse it? Two steps. Step one, I create a series of positive anchors in my own body, a series of them. So how do you do that? You put yourself in a peak state. Now so you say, well, how do I do that, Tony? Well, you can do it by changing physiology or you could do it by remembering a time and then fully associating to that. So let me give you an example. I'll do one for real. Let's see. Um, pretend I got this negative anchor here. 
So I'm going to do two steps. I'm going to create a series of positive anchors. Then I'm going to fire the positive anchor and negative anchor simultaneously in the nervous system. And they will collide in the brain. And what they do is the one that's strongest then dominates and eliminates the other one. Okay? So how would I anchor myself? I think of a time in life when I felt really, really great, really strong. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Yes! And what I do is at the peak, I do something really unique. I don't go, yep. Okay? That's not really unique. It's very rare you're going to go, yes, with that intensity and touch that specific part of your body. So that's really unique. And I don't have to do that. I could have gone, yes, yes. Yeah, I could have done whatever. But it's what I'm choosing for me because the state I want to be is strong. So I think of another time when I felt just unstoppable because I want to get rid of the negative feeling. I think of another one, yes. I think of another one, yes. I think of another one. No, not that one. Uh, uh, let's see. Yes, yes. One more. Yes. Okay, now what do you do? Interrupt your pattern. Get out of state so you can see if it works, right? And so now I got this thing. I think about it and I just go, yes. And I can feel it in my body instantly. So I got an anchor that works. If it didn't work, it's because I didn't really get fully associated. Or sometimes people like try to anchor themselves in states, you know, with triggers to take them out of state. Like they're, they want to anchor laughing. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that's not the best anchor for that. Okay. You want something more consistent. Okay. So now I got this thing. So how to get rid of the negative? I do this. Watch. I go. Yes! And if you watch somebody when you do this, it'll freak them out if they saw what you see. So don't like, oh my God. Because what you'll see very often is one side of the face will go up, one side of the face will go down asymmetrical. It's not going to stay that way. It's because you fired totally different sensations in the brain simultaneously. And when they collide, the ones that's strongest will collapse the other one. So, or sometimes they'll just look at you for a second like this and they'll just kind of stare at you and see almost no change. And if you just wait, hold their hands together or whatever it is you're collapsing, you watch them and then all of a sudden they'll go. You'll see this change in breath. Then you pull their hands apart or whatever it is that was being anchored. In my case, I pull this apart. Now, it's really important you stack the positive anchor. What stack means is you do more than one. Why? What if I have this super negative anchor here and on my right side over here, I try and create a positive anchor. I think over time I felt pretty good and I go, yep, yep. Guess what? Now I'm depressed on both sides. Because this is not more powerful than this. How many follow that? Say I. I. You might say, well, Tony, but what if, you know, I don't know where I was touched. Maybe I wasn't touched. It's just when I'm around my boss, I freak out, man. I totally freak out. I'm or authority figures. Well, here's what you do. You create a series of positive anchors, right? And then all you have to do is, remember I taught you about files, you know, on Friday night, how your brain links things together? All you have to do is think about your boss. Every touch, every conversation is all in that file. So all you do is you got the positive anchors, you think about your boss, you think about your boss, you think about your boss. <laughs> and now all of a sudden you think about your boss, you feel strong for some reason, right? And it literally will collapse it. So you don't need to know the content to get rid of something. You just reprogram the impulses in your nervous system, and that you can do literally in a couple of minutes. And I made this kind of crazy and insane and fun, but you can do this for anything in the future. And I still use this. Something comes up really bugs me, boom, I bring out my power anchor, boom, I bring out the other, back and forth, back and forth, wham, I fire them both off. Feelings change. Versus I could go in my head a million times trying to work that out. It'll never work doing it in your head. Never. Even if you think it does, it'll come back. This won't come back because you're literally rewired. Now, I built my whole career by doing demonstrations with a variety of tools like this. I can remember one of my early demonstrations, it was in, in New York City, and this woman, I used to like challenge anybody, give me your worst problem, this one woman was really, really mean. And she goes, fine, what about me? You know, I've been there therapy six or seven years, let's see you solve my problem. So what's your problem? I hate my father, I hate his guts. I haven't spoken to him in six years, the therapist says we're making progress, but I still hate his guts. And I said, well, come on up here, I'll handle it in one minute. She said, oh, yeah, sure. I said, come over here. I grab her right hand and yank it. She looks at me. I said, who do you like? Clearly, you hate your father. Who do you like? Who do you love? And I just gradually got her in state. And then I anchored all her favorite best friend's faces and her boyfriend in this hand. Then I grabbed her left hand. I said, put your father's face in there. And she started, you could just see her face looking like this when she looked at him. And all I did was back and forth, back and forth, gradually doing it. All of a sudden, I grabbed her hands and just wham, pulled them together really hard. And she went like this for a second. Lasted about five seconds. She watched her eyes get really big. Waited, pulled her hands apart. Said, how do you feel about your dad? Just like I said, how do you feel about your husband? 
She went, I love him, of course. It was like nothing had ever gone on. I said, yeah, but what about all the things he's done to you? She said, well, I did some pretty mean things to him too. But I love him. That was it. And it looks like a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's using the human nervous system that our creator gave us the way it was designed to be used. But no one ever taught us. We have the greatest, absolute greatest gift in the world right here. And if you like computers, you got the almost incredible computer on earth here. But the problem is no one ever gave you an owner's manual. And it's not user friendly, right? You know, so you got to know how to use it, right? That's what it really is. So, by the way, this, this young girl has been to, that was like 15 years ago. I think she maybe have missed two or three seminars in all those years of my coming to New York. And her father came and everything else. So she's lying on her back for six years. It took me a minute. Not because I'm so smart, because just doing the right effective thing, the right strategy. You can do this for the rest of your life. Because I did this so fast, and it was kind of playful. Don't take for granted what you have right now in your right hand. You got a tool to change how you feel about anything. All you got to strengthen it, think of the other one, fire it off and collapse it. That's a hell of a lot better than analyzing it or making yourself nuts or writing for hours in your journal. And I'll give you one last example. I'm sure you remember the story. Many of you know that Federal Express is based in Memphis, right? And so when you send something, it doesn't matter where you send it from in the country, it goes to Memphis first and then gets rerouted to where it's going to go. And when Federal Express is first starting, there's a story about they had this huge distribution center that was about the size or bigger than this main room in the early days. And it was filled with like, I don't know, 50, 60 different conveyor belts, you know, to move all the packages around. It's the lifeblood of Federal Express at that time. And if those things stop moving, any one of them, they're going to lose a lot of money because the planes are going to be late and all heck's going to break loose. One day, not one, not two, not three, every single one of the conveyor belts stops simultaneously. Simultaneously. They immediately think it must be an electrical problem, but all the lights are on, everything else is functioning perfectly. They are freaking out. Every minute this is down, they're losing tens of thousands of dollars. So they call the repairman, and they said, look, we got an emergency, we need you here now. And they ran to your raving, he said, look, I'm five minutes away. I'll be right over. Guy comes over, he walks in the room, the place is dead stop. The owner is just freaking out. You gotta help me. Guy looks around, assesses the situation for a moment, then walks straight to this one pole right in the middle of the room. He opens this little metal box. He takes out one screwdriver. He turns one screw a quarter of an inch and everything in the whole place starts up. Every conveyor belt's moving, the noise is working perfectly. I mean, the owner is beside himself. He's so happy. So he comes to the guy and says, oh my God, you saved my life. How much do I owe you? And he said, $10,000. The guy said, $10,000? He said, you were here for what, four or five minutes? He said, that's right, $10,000. And the owner's a little upset. So he says, well, you know what? How about you give me an itemized bill on that? The guy said, I don't need to leave to do that. Give me a pen and paper and I'll give you an itemized bill. The guy gets a pen and paper, he writes it down. The owner reads it, nods his head, smiles, says, you're right goes to the safe, pays the guy in cash. You know what the note says? Turning screw, one dollar. Knowing which screw to turn, 9,999. <laughs> so there's nothing we've done here that's really been complex. It's all simple common sense for the most part but what you learned is not just to turn screws that's the common sense part you begin to learn to which screw needs to be turned and that's where all the power is Before you finish listening, Nightingale Conant wants you to know about another inspiring, empowering program by Tony Robbins. Are you tired of settling for less than you can be, less than you can achieve, or less than you deserve? Would you like to learn to live with passion so that you can turn your everyday experiences into extraordinary, life-changing events? In the best-selling Tony Robbins audio program, Live With Passion, you'll acquire the vital life tools that will help you tap the power of your own passion. No one can live a life that's fulfilled without a sense of meaning. See, we've been put here for a reason. The question is why? And the answer I think is different for every one of us. It's different for me than it is for you, and yet it's the same. 
Every one of us has been put here. Every one of us is unique and different and special. And I believe our creator, if I may use the word God, if I may, God has put you here for a reason. The question is, what is it? God does not create things without a purpose. Everything on earth serves a purpose. Why are you here? What are you here to do? What are you here to become, to create, and to give? These are some of the most significant questions that you can answer in your life. And even when you answer them, I'm sure that as your life expands, you'll come up with better answers as you get more experience and you get closer in touch with your own innermost being and maybe closer in touch with your creator as well. I'm really going to the essence of giving your life what you deserve, which is knowing that there are no mistakes, knowing that every little thing you do has a consequence. It can be a positive consequence if you choose it. The most powerful thing that has consequence in your life, though, is the thing we talk about so often, but I got to say it again, and that is what's really ultimately shaping our lives are our decisions. Join America's results coach, Tony Robbins, for Live With Passion and begin to push past your obstacles, redefine and improve your life, and get started today living with more passion, happiness, and fulfillment than ever before. This concludes Tony Robbins' Unleash the Power Within. Thanks for listening.